Welcome to the Lost Rewatch. We're continuing to go on. Before I before I say anything, I, I forgot to I forgot to tell the guys before this. This will be the last rewatch until after the first of the year. We're going to take a two week break because people are saying, "Hey, I, this two episodes a week is too much. It's going too fast." So, uh, can you slow down a little bit? And I figured during the holidays, it'd be the perfect time for everyone to catch up on it, and we'll start fresh on uh, on. Uh, after January, I forgot what month comes after December. It's what happens when you get older. But today, I'm joined by Ethan and Eckhart. How's it going, guys? Hello. Hello. Are you Good. are you excited about t- talking about loss? Excited and nervous, Absolutely. but yes, yeah. And hey, no reason to be nervous. I know. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll direct the hate mail to you. Okay. If, if there is any, but no, nah, it's, it's it's. I think it's because you have true. You just have lost fans watching this, so it's 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 you know. For the most part, it's pretty easy, you know, it's going. I mean, it's the ones that are committed from season one through season six, not the ones that started it and said, oh, it's stupid and all that other stuff. Right. It's true Lost fans that are watching. So don't be nervous about anything. But before we go on, I'd like to ask you both new guests on the on the show. How did you get into Lost? We'll start with Ethan. How, how, what, what is your Lost experience? Um, well, we, me and my wife, we heard that the show was good and we knew we were probably going to like it. So we waited out a little bit. And, um, after the second season ended, we bought the first season DVDs. And, uh, I guess, you know, a day or two later, we're running to the store to buy the second season DVDs. (laughs) And, uh, you know, and, you know, when that hatch stuff happens, I mean, that, that's me all over, I'm all in. And so we were, we were live watching by the third season and, uh, and we were just on from there, and it was about season towards the end of season six. I started to feel the emptiness to talk to people, and that's when I found uh, podcasts and Jay and Jack and, and things like that. So that did, did your yeah. did your wife stay, did your wife stay with it through the end? Oh yeah, she watched. We watched the whole series to the end. She's not a rewatcher like I am, but right. uh, she's she's she sat through a couple of couple of them with me. Yeah, it's cool. Nice. And yeah, Eckhart, I had a very similar experience. Yes, thank you, Dad. Um, I had a similar experience, <laughs> except I started maybe a season later. Like I, I got into it right around the time that probably season three ended, and I was really skeptical. Um, but you know, once I started watching it, and I think my wife was interested, and I was watching kind of over her shoulder. And to me, what I realized very early on is that I started getting the same feelings that I did when I was in high school when. I was watching Twin Peaks, which I also joined late too. And it makes perfect sense in retrospect because Lindelof is Lindelof watched Twin Peaks around the same time as I did in high school and is a disciple of Lynch's. And the whole aspect of, like Ethan mentioned, the mystery of the hatch and the right. whole and 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 all these um, supernatural and um, yeah, almost magical elements, unexplained elements, which we're going to talk about today, <laughs> um, really hooked me into it because it was, you know, it was popular, but it was also sci-fi. Right. And to really hit those two notes as well as it did was like an amazing feat. Because usually if there was something that was really good on the sci-fi front, you know, it wouldn't last for more than a season on network TV. If there was something that was just really good on the drama side that didn't have sci-fi, you know, I probably wouldn't watch it. So, yeah, I, I started late and um, I got caught up. I watched like three seasons like in one clip, just like Ethan did, just getting the DVDs. And then when I was ready for season four to start, I started searching for the podcast. And that's where I found my long lost dad. <laughs> and, uh, and just started listening to those early episodes over and over. And that. And, and you've hinted at this many times since then, Jack. There are certain shows that are great for podcasting. Yeah. And obviously, Lost was the first one that you did and one of the greatest ones. But you want to have a good show where people are willing to debate something, exchange right. ideas, and, and disagree agreeably, right? But it become, became like a joint effort to try and figure out, like, what all this stuff was. Right. So... And I think in many ways it set the tone for many of the other shows that have come since then in terms of the way that we approach it. Like we don't just watch it anymore to watch it and then maybe read an article and eat Entertainment Weekly or one of the other websites. We want to hear people talk about it. So, right. I mean, it's it's kind of the birth of all that culture, everything that started there, yep. everything we do today with Westworld or 
or um, uh, Watchmen or The Leftovers or whatever. It's all born from this experience with Lost. So, I mean, yep. uh, you know, for, and it's, the internet's great for having all these TV junkies come together. Maybe you're not, uh, have anyone at home that you can do this with, but you find the other people that are having the same experience and you want to talk about it with them and figure out what the bird sound is or, you know, whatever right. it is. Yeah. Well, it, 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 what it is, the, it is the best show because I podcast about a lot of TV shows, some good, some bad. And some great shows. I mean, some you know, the Watchmen, the Leftovers, but nothing, nothing can top Lost because it, like you said, Eckhart, it was it just it consumed you. You know, like you said, Ethan, you wanted to talk to someone right away about it. I mean, it, it just was an amazing experience, and I'm glad I'm glad I got to be a part of it because BSG, I didn't watch it till after it was over. Right. So yeah. I, I missed I missed that whole you know because people said it, yeah it had similar a similar community. But I, I messed out on it because I didn't. I was watching Lost, and I was so consumed by that I couldn't give my attention to any other show. But uh, yeah, in, for- in many ways, I mean, Jack, we owe you. I mean, both Ethan and I owe you a debt of gratitude because I mean, you and a few other people really did like trail this, uh, blaze this trail for podcasting about these esoteric shows. And I say this because. I mentioned Twin Peaks as being in many ways the touchstone for a lot of my TV viewing. And for it is for me what probably what for Jay is lost because of the age at which I watched it. But when season three Twin Peaks came out two years ago, because of the great work that you guys did on Lost and other people did on, on, on Lost and similar shows, there was a community that formed or reformed around Twin Peaks, a show that was off the air for 25 years. And wow. that when season three came on, it's not only were we excited to watch it, we knew exactly how to discuss it. And like, you know, the format of the two podcasts per week and quickly found each other. And the amazing thing about it was that you had, during season three of Twin Peaks, on two separate occasions, you actually had Lindelof podcasting about Twin Peaks as a fanboy, right? Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. So, and the the thing of the funny thing about it was, and you'll appreciate this, and then we'll get back onto the topic of Lost, is that um, the first podcast that like Entertainment Weekly did on Twin Peaks after the, they released season three was smack in the middle of Leftovers, right? Season three. Okay. So Lindelof was on to talk about Twin Peaks, and he's talking about Twin Peaks like for an hour. And at the end of the interview, he's like, oh, and please, can you guys also watch my show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a funny he's a extremely smart, but he's very funny too. He's yeah. just a very uh, he just some guy. He's just someone you want to hang out with because he's just you know he's a he is he is a fan of TV and movies. And so when like I said, he's the one that got me to watch The Wire. I heard him on he was doing a podcast and he kept saying The Wire, The Wire. I go, all right, I'm gonna give it a shot, and I'm glad I did because it's a fantastic show. I mean, it's just and, and to and talk about a show that is nothing like Lost. Right, it's, still it's not great. It's just, yeah, it's fantastic. And so, a show I've only watched once, and I keep saying I got to rewatch it. I got to rewatch it. I got to rewatch it. But something else always comes along. But yeah, he, he, I've a couple times he suggested things on a podcast. I listen. To it, I go, well, I got to watch it because I've never watched Twin Peaks because I had kids, and I had to work. You know, I was working. You know, lots of hours. And so when Twin Peaks came out, people go, I go, well, no, I'm, I'm at work, and you know, we had VCRs, but the kids would have all their stuff on. You know, I just you can only tape record so many shows back then with a V. It wasn't like when you had DVR, you could put you know record up to five shows, and and you know you'd have five, you'd have different rooms with different. You know, we had one TV, and that was it. And so I never got into. I mean, but I well, should go back and watch it though. And my parents should, were always but, watching I mean, Dallas, so I couldn't watch anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it it does kind of also stress one point, which is something that we can think about with. Lost and also now with Watchmen that just ended, which is that in many times, in many ways, like the time that you're living in really difficult to do. And um, you can see, like when I'm watching Lost, I can't help but compare it to Watchmen and Leftovers, right? Right. And um, I know that when we were watching, when Lost was on TV, you mentioned like a few times in joking, Jack, like what lost on hbo would be like and the first thing you'd always say was like rose would curse a lot yeah (laughs) she would you know know, she has a uh, 
you know, a, a truck was it? They call it that- truckers, uh, truckers, whatever they used to. I, I forget the slogan. That- so you, one of the reasons you missed Twin Peaks was because it got canceled so quickly because it didn't last in that type of environment. And in many ways, it was ahead of its time. And Lindelof will be the first to say that like Twin Peaks was probably the biggest influence on Lost for him in terms of everything from the, the drama to the mysteriousness aspect. But when I was watching these two episodes for Lost, I just couldn't help but think about the fact that like the storytelling behind all aspects was phenomenal in both episodes. Right. But at the same time, they did, they did feel like dated is the right term, but they felt like almost like innocent compared to what we're used to now seeing from Lindelof in terms of leftovers and right. Watchmen. And it's, be, it's because of the medium of ABC versus HBO. Right. And I think that, yeah, you, that, that has so much to do with like, you know, the 24 episode format going to a 10 episode format and be willing to get to the to the meat of what the story is without mm-hmm. sometime having all the superfluous stuff around that you maybe you don't need yeah i mean i, I again I, I wonder if lost going back to hbo what it, or you know netflix whatever it would have been uh, you know if it's 13 episode season i mean i i'm happy with what we got i mean i enjoy oh, yeah. watching Especially when you're watching these episodes, I'm like, yeah, I enjoy watching. And especially when it was on, I I loved. I know a lot of people didn't like it; they got tired of it, and they thought it was, you know, they were stretching it out. And they were, you know, when they added Nikki and Paolo and some of the other characters, they were stretching it out, but they had to because of what you know. The network television, you go, no, we want our 23 episodes. We want, you know, we're this thing's making money. We're going on until we can go on. But this is a show. I'm glad that they stuck Lindelof and Coop stuck to their guns and said no. We need to end. We need an end date because it would have ruined its uh, legacy. If it's, if it's still going on, say you know, because shows go on. You know, look at Grey's Anatomy. I, I can't believe that show's still on. But it, it's, my wife's doing her like 18th rewatch right now. She just did her. I go, why? She goes, I love this show, and I think it's. I just I can't stand it. It's just it's one of those shows that we we just disagree on. Where she, go ahead and watch it. I'm not going to watch it. But. Yeah, but but hospital that's procedural and hospitals they don't really close. So. I get that. I I because I I love DR. Right, I love DR you too. Yeah. So okay, you know, but it's like okay, I can't watch any more hospital shows. I need yeah. a break. DR was like 15 years, but you know, if Lost would have gone on like 12, 13 years, what's the odds of it having its legacy? You know, it it might have gone Dexter level bad. You don't you don't you just don't know. Yeah. Because yeah. some shows just like Breaking Bad. Okay, we got to start, middle, and and I think that's what you know. Lost also changed television because it had an end date and, and pe- people said, okay, we're going to, we're going to cancel this way. We're, we're going to go out when we're on top and we're not going to stretch the story out where it's going all over the place where it just gets convoluted. And it's like, all right, I can't, t- I can't take this anymore. You know, even, and even though they had an end date, you, I did little worry a little cause there were so many seasons. I wondered what they were going to do. And my favorite is five. I just want to say that out, out, out the gate. Cause I'm a time travel nerd, but yeah, I'm glad they, <laughs> I'm glad they got an end date. And uh, we're able to go towards it. But the well, I, interesting I thing about sorry, the interesting thing about this experience of um, you know watching Lost live and then now watching the rewatch was, and this is sorry not to toot my horn here, but one of the things that happened to us people who are watching Twin Peaks live was it taught us a really hard lesson that when a series ends you might not get all the answers that you want or the answers that are presented to you might not seem satisfactory. But over time, then, as you go back and watch it, you start to notice other things and realize that, like, it's not about trying to solve all the mysteries. It's about, like, enjoying the scenes and how the director and the producer painted the story, right? right? So that when the final season of Lost was airing and they were starting to kind of give some answers to me the most amazing thing about the final season were the flash sideways those little vignettes where they allowed all those actors to basically take on different roles in a different right. you know universe and to me i mean like one of the best episodes ever was the episode about ben linus being the high school teacher oh yeah and because it really allowed him like to play a role that was different from what he had and you know, the actor to show his ability. So as I'm watching these two episodes, um, the one about Kate and the one about Mr. Echo, like I'm noticing all sorts of things 
that didn't know us the first time because the first time we're too like focused on you know what is the smoke monster what is this number they're typing into the computer and that stuff is all really interesting but like underneath the surface of that were all these stories that Lindelof was already telling and um i couldn't help but think about like if we talk about the first episode the kate story like if the kate story was on hbo i mean it was a tough story i mean it obviously talks about abuse in the in the home right but i think the more I think about it, it's like if that story was done today in HBO, they probably would have had another angle about like a struggle with sexual identity, which would have been really like fit really well, like with Kate's story, given where she was from, what part of the country she was from. Right. That's you could true. have seen like, and it's like, I almost have a feeling like that was like a direction Lindelof might have wanted to take it, but because it was ABC and in the mid 2000s, you couldn't do that yet then. No, no, you had to keep it semi clean, right? No, it's just like it was like a, a topic that was too difficult, right? <laughs> right, yeah, sure. Well, even to, even today, you, you like you with Hallmark, right? With Hallmark, it's right. like, I mean, what is, what were they thinking? I mean, I don't want to get too political, but what were you right. thinking? I mean, it just, but anyway, I don't want to get into that. But but my first heard about, it, I go, well, that's not gonna go over well. And it didn't. And, 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 it's, it's like, come on. <laughs> and they and they recanted and they apologized and they still got slammed on Saturday Night Live hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I bo I boycott Hallmark just because I don't like the shows on there. But that's just that's just right. me. They, they, they don't they don't they don't interest me. But you care I know people sure. like I know a lot of people like Hallmark, but it's just like I, I just couldn't. I was like going, is it? I first I really I'll be honest with you, I thought it was a joke. Right. I thought it was a joke. Then I thought I go, this is real. I go, okay, this is going to just be a crap storm on on twitter and social network because it's just a stupid move but and, anyway and, and their cards are really expensive now too they are yes yes yeah, they're like eight dollars for a card so it's ridiculous i say that all the time because my wife will get cards for the kids for like hollow i go they just give them some candy these cards like eight bucks i don't care about these cards i'm gonna do it it's tradition i love i, I want to do it for my grandkids i said okay all right whatever dollar tree two for a dollar they got them and, and, and she doesn't talk that way but you know she did <laughs> I, that's how I. So, Ethan, I have, Ethan, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, do you ha do you have kids? I have one child. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. when you rewatched Lost, now I'm yeah. assuming the first time you watched Lost, did you have kids yet? No. So, me neither. And the one thing I really realized now, as I'm rewatching it, is like how much more I'm attuned to the storyline. Well, do you have do you have kids? I assume. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I have like, two sons, and we can get we can get into that when we get into the Michael stuff a little bit, because I mean, you know, I don't want to jump ahead. Maybe we, it's a free flow thing at this point, but like, you know, I don't know how Jack. <laughs> when you well, get I was, to I, I was going to start out, yeah. you know, what Kate did, and I, I one of the funnier scenes in the whole series is when Jin and Son come out. You know, I've obviously hadn't been <laughs> seeing each other for a while. And obviously they had had a good time. And Hurley gives the, when Sun turns, Hurley goes, gives the thumbs up. No words exchange. But to me, it's always been one of the funnier scenes in all of Lost. I had a question: Is that Desmond on the beach? The first thing you see, or did he run away already? Like he's, he's, he's gone by yeah, now. No, he, he's gone by now. Yeah, he's okay. he, he's we don't know where he's at. He ran, he took off and ran. I found the and, and we don't know where he's at, but then you see also, but you get the funny scene, but in great lost fashion, you have you, your son turns around and sees Saeed digging a grave for Shannon. Yeah. So you have comedy and then, oh my God, there's Shannon. And I was having trouble deciphering if she was having some more mistrust for him or just feeling empathy because he's digging this grave. I mean, her face mm -hmm. kind of showed both of those things. I could talk. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm gonna go with it. it. Was she felt bad for Saeed? because okay. she had she had uh, towards the end she got kind of close with not close with Shannon, but at least she was talking to her. Right, they were they were <laughs> communicating. So uh, Jack is working on Sawyer. Uh, Sawyer tells Kate uh, he loves her. And no, so, so, like, Sawyer well, Sawyer tells Jack. Sawyer. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so, and he's like Jack tells Jack I love her. That's right. Yeah. So we're thinking, oh, this is awkward. Because Jack gets really upset. Yeah. Yeah, Jack gets really upset. But is Sawyer talking about Kate? 
I can only assume at this point we haven't met Madison yet, have we? No. Yeah, so. So. I I mean I I always wonder if I always wonder if he was talking about Kate. I mean, I assumed he was. You know. Okay. What about you, Eckhart? You think he was? Yeah. I mean, it's I almost felt like they wanted to signal that he has some sort of affection for her. So right. probably more extreme than he was willing to let on. I mean, he was feverish, right? Right. And these he two episodes, too, she, she seems to be really in disorder. Even though she kisses Jack. She's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's literally all over the place in this episode. <laughs> yeah. But then we have a great scene where Kate's gathering mangoes. I'm assuming they're mangoes. They mangoes. I thought they were mangoes. Uh, and she sees a black horse, which I don't know why it was so strange on an island where there's polar. Even I think Charlie says, well, there's polar bears. I mean, there's all kinds of things. I mean, I don't know why a black horse would be so strange, but we don't know at the time that means something to her. Right? Sure. But at that time, I'm like, going, I don't get why she's so crazy about the black horse um by the way there's a there's a reference to twin peaks in that scene oh is it because oh, in twin that? peaks in twin peaks one of the characters sees a white horse and they see it once and it never gets used again and people were debating it for like 30 years what it meant <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. did it mean go ahead and spoil me don't know they never figured it out oh okay it was <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's like, so that when I, that was the thing too. Like, as I'm watching this, I'm like trying to remember if like some of these, all these things actually end up getting just kind of throw away some bolts. Right. So, well, I mean, I mean, let's get into it for a second. The horse is because now, you know, later on when it's confirmed that it's there, uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's Jacob or the man in black doing something to her to get her somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like to get right. her some sense of closure on something. So I mean, we know that's what so, the horse. So is if it's man in black, there has to be a would have to be a dead horse on the island, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I think the positive ones are Jacob, and this was a positive one. Okay, so <laughs> that's what I think. Because man in black can only manifest things that have died, right? Correct. Is that? I wasn't. I didn't think we were gonna get this deep. No, yeah. I well, I'm, so. I'm just. I'm just I'm, <laughs> I'm sure have, there's I, like a d- Dharma f- zoo graveyard <laughs> you can take his pick from. Yeah, right. oh, pro- that's true. I forgot about that. An ancient Indian barrel down somewhere. <laughs> and and this is where going to Kate, where her Wayne comes home. And it's funny that that, that the Wayne, that this actor always cracks me up because we had the finale party in Los Angeles. He just showed up. The, the actor just showed up, and I was like going, I'm like going, who is that guy? He looks familiar. It turned out to be the guy that played Wayne. On Un- Unholy Wayne? Unholy Wayne, yeah. He just showed up and yeah, Unholy he just showed up and we're like, oh, okay, that's fine. I think he even went up on stage. I could be wrong, but I he uh just showed up. But okay, so he comes home, he's drunk, he's talking to Kate, oh, you're so pretty and stuff like that. Do we think because she denies it, but do we think he he sexually abused her? Does he know? That she's his daughter. Biologically, does she? Does he know that? I don't know. Because that's that's the question I was. Because it's like you sure look pretty. So is it you sure look pretty? Like I want to be creepy and gross, or is it you sure look pretty? Like uh, you're my daughter, and I know I'm not supposed to say anything, but you've grown into a beautiful woman. I mean, it didn't sound like that. This but. is where we needed this to be on HBO to get a clear answer. On HBO, yeah. they did <laughs> and purposely in, leave it vague. And why did she take off his boots if she was just going to blow him up? Yeah. Well, maybe because you know she's trying to set up a, she's trying to make it look as real as possible, right? Right, right, right. So she's plus she wants to make we, sure Wink can't run out. <laughs> <laughs> can't run out without his boots, right? And plus, that's like a that's an area of shame for people that have been abused. They don't want to talk about it. You know what I mean? And they right. want to deny it. So you know, doesn't well, doesn't it was ne- it was never answered. But I I just think there had to be something. I mean, I know he was he was abusive to the mom, Diane. I know that. But I just I just think there's something because she's so angry when she talks about him, 
And I, I you know, it, again, he's abusive to her mom. He has, she has every right to be angry. I actually had no, no problem with what she did with what Kate did. The, the guy just seems like he's dirt, but uh, yeah, I just, uh, I've always felt that there was more there to the story. Like with the Marshall, I always thought the Marshall and the Marshall cared about Kate. There was something there we didn't get, we didn't get information on because it's personal with him. It's too personal with him. Whereas, whereas I don't think a Marshall would be that. She's not public enemy number one, right? I mean, obviously she killed somebody, and you know it has to do her time. But I, I just there's just stories that, that, that I get. That's what the beauty of loss, where you can like you start talking Twin Peaks, you, the White Horse. We can argue this till we're blue in the face, and there's no answer. So you can you can believe whatever you want, which I like, I, which I love about Lost. Yep. Well, it's great. I mean, you talk about the Marshall in terms of the way that, like, because he's making those snide remarks, and it, it it does really sound like you know, it's not somebody who's saying it just to be a jerk. It's almost someone who's saying it almost like an uncle, right? Right. <laughs> but you can just, I guess you kind of like wish that somebody could actually say, look, when they were casting the scene, Lindelof or whoever was directing was saying that what were the instructions he was giving the marshal, right? What was he telling right. them to think about? Because right? that would give more hints in terms of like what you're getting at. Well, I, I can remember talking to a couple of the actors and they said that a lot of times it was, they would give you something, but it was so vague that you didn't really know you had to kind of come up with your own, you know, your own interpretation of what was going on because they didn't want to tell you what was going on further down the road. Because they didn't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but that's in itself an amazing like storytelling feat in the sense that he's actually using his actors or in many ways, the audience reaction to guide him forward. Right. So it could have been a situation where, like, in one of the first flashbacks with the marshal, was this the first flashback with the marshal? No, no, because no, no, no. Yeah. There's there's a couple other ones, yeah. Yeah. So that I'm sure there was something that he did in one of those first scenes that made the light bulb go off in the last head, and he's like, "All right, that use that each time." <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because uh, go ahead. Well, they showed her. They showed them in the crash, and they showed her getting caught in Australia by him. Right. Right. Um, but this is the first time they're meeting, right? Right. So, I mean, yeah, totally just rolling everything that you've been using into this part but, right here. Well, but like you said, he's he's talking to Kate, you know, hey, did he did he kind of come to your room? Did he kind of, you know, he's he's almost antagonizing her. He's he, he I mean, I I know she he did punch her in the face. He's got a bandage on his nose and and stuff like that. But he he's he just is um He's going for there, confession. There, yeah, I guess, but there's 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 just something about him, like I said, especially deck down the line when he goes to Australia, when he's going to different things. It's when he's when he's at the airport and he's checking in his guns and stuff like that. There's so many things. It's personal with him. I mean, it's it's like she, you know, she would call him up. So there was something more there. Either he felt there was something more there, but we never got any answers to what. But that's what Kate would do, though. Kate would would flirt and use, you know, her charm to kind of get what she wanted. I mean, to her, you know, that's just what she did. And she got to drop on him a lot by doing that. He probably was taking that personally. Right. Yeah. yeah the, okay. The, the first time I watched those scenes with the marshal, the vibe I always got was that it was almost like he was inspired by one of the, like, lawmen characters from um, Natural Born Killers. Right. Oh yeah. Skagnetti on that movie. Skagnetti on Skagnetti. Yeah. So it was just like yeah. it gave it had more of that type of vibe, right? Huh. Yeah. And I think and I think maybe her denial of it is also like he tried, but he never touched. He tried a lot, but I never let him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She she's very adamant about it, but it just yeah. just to me, I I never believed it. I just thought it was more. Uh, and then she goes to her mom. And, you know, she goes, here, mom, there's insurance policy out in your name. What did you do, Kate? What did you do? What did you do? And she's there with a bandage on her wrist and stuff like that. She goes, I love him, Kate. What do you want me to do? I love him. And it's pretty true to life. I mean, there's a lot of this. This is not a, a new story. Unfortunately, it happens all the time. But I just felt you feel bad for Kate because Kate, you know, 
did it for her mom and her mom just says turns her in yeah so but her mom, how old her is mom kid supposed to be at this time 20 20 she's 24 yeah okay I don't know. I just, I, I just terrible mom. I'm sorry. I, I, I wouldn't turn on my kid for that. Right. That, that's just me. Uh, let's see. Jack tells Kate uh, she should go back to the beach for Shannon's, Shannon's funeral. But Kate says, no, you go. I'll stay. So that's kind of like going back and forth. You know, Kate doesn't want to go to the funeral. Jack goes, I'll go to the funeral. Um, why do you think Kate? Because Kate did. Did Kate want to spend more time with Sawyer, or she's just not good around death and stuff like that? I think she just saw a horse and she's freaking out, and she doesn't <laughs> want to be around people. Because she does say I mean? she's going. She does say she's going crazy. A, she says it a lot to many people this episode. Yeah. And then we have Echo goes to Anna, Anna, Anna Lucia, who's. Bearing a stake. She's hitting a stake, a wooden stake. I, I don't know what she was trying to build there, but it's like it's, she's bearing. I mean, obviously, she's probably trying to make a shelter, but she's. I, I didn't know what she was doing there, but I think it was just for effects that, you know, they're trying to show her working, but the stake was like two feet off the off the ground. I don't know what it was going to do. Uh, but Echo tells her he's going to go to the funeral. But she says, I don't think people want to see me there, which is probably the right thing, right? He just killed her, you know, just killed Shannon. So, and then Saeed gives the eulogy and he says he loved her. It got, um, a little it got a little teary there. Yeah. And I, you know, I was trying to work hard on my sarcasm on, because on, I know it doesn't translate <laughs> all the time really well on YouTube. <laughs> but, um, you know, in big blue block letters, I wrote here obviously he is having a hard time because as we all know, Shannon was his, the biggest love of his life and he never ever loved anyone the way he loved Shannon. Sarcasm. Yeah. Cause there was someone else he loved. No, there wasn't not, 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 you know, from what we know of this episode and in the future, this is it. This is, this is yeah, it for him. That's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> he did care about her though. And like he sure. said, it's it's sure. it's something. If we were in the real world, we never would have met. Because right. remember, Shannon called the uh, airport security on him about him. Can you watch my bag? She goes, Yeah, whatever. And then she, Boone comes up and says something. And of course, she has to get back at Boone. To get back at Boone means punishing someone else. And she, you know, she she had this Arab guy came here and just left his bag here. You know, she throws him under the bus, and it just so he's right. If if the island brought them together course it also torn them apart yep sad story uh then we have kate and now now here because it comes down another theory now sawyer wakes up and says why did you try why did you kill me and starts strangling kate now do we think this is wayne i i definitely thought they were trying to insinuate that but it, again it was so vague that they really leave it up to the viewers to interpret it. And I forgot. Like they're like, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I just forgot how actually did Sawyer get hurt in the episode or two before? What was he shot by Anna Lucia? He, no, he was shot by uh, uh, one of the guys on the boat when they took Walt. Okay. Because he 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 it's a uh, he gets shot. He falls in the water. He actually takes the bullet out himself. Right. And then it's you know festering. It's good and all. Messed up as he traps through the jungle, you know, goes through the jungle and stuff like that. By the time he gets to the the hatch, he's, you know, he's got an infection. It's going through his bloodstream, all that different stuff. So yeah, he got shot from from yeah. And he only had one bullet, and okay. she saved it. She saved it for Shannon. <laughs> got her name on it on the side. Yeah. But yeah, I always thought it was Wayne. Too. I always thought it was Wayne too. I, I I said it had to be Wayne. But they they do such again. It's great storytelling because that could have been Wayne, but it also could have been just Sawyer. Someone from his past, mm -hmm. and he's you know he's hallucinating. He's you know he's got fever and all the different stuff. So again, it's it's not black and white, but it's up for us to figure out, you know what what's going on. But Kate definitely thinks it's Wayne talking to her. And make no doubt about it, if he had Wolverine claws, she'd be dead because he went full. Yeah, he was he, he yeah. was strangler pretty good. Yeah, uh, we have what. Uh, uh, Locke and Jack come back in just in uh, and then Locke's having trouble. He's panicking. He's having trouble punching the numbers. He's like, uh, 22. No, 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 no. 
Fred gets it. Uh, he gets it, and Kate is nowhere to be found. Kate just left. You have Sawyer laying on the ground there. And so Jack is like, what is going on with Kate? This is crazy. Uh, then we have Kate in line buying it. Uh, no, she talks to Charlie about the horse. That's what she talked about, Charlie, about the horse. He says, well, yeah, there's there's polar bears. Why, why wouldn't there be a horse? Because I haven't seen a horse. There's a smoke monster. It kills people. What doesn't kill people? But, you know, I haven't seen it kill people. He's kind of, it's kind of a funny scene. But Kate, you can see she's just, uh, Evangeline Lily, I thought she did great. Act, she did a great job acting in this episode. I thought she was fantastic because she really, you really can see that she was stressed out about what was going on and that her past was coming back to haunt her and all that different stuff. Uh, well, she's buying a ticket to Tallahassee and then we have the marshal behind her going about being pretty about, you know, doing this stuff. She turns around and she doesn't know who he is, but then she observes, you know, the different agents there, you know, one's reading a paper. She knows what's going on. She punches the, the marshal in the face and she hits pretty hard. At least, at least on TV, she does. Yeah, she got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, but the, they that's never when we get to the whole explained thing. why she was so perceptive, right? Though, like in terms of her background up to that point in life. Well, she's a that's tracker, true. you know. She just, you know. I mean, this is kind of explaining why she's a tracker now, but they're not explaining like how she developed those skills. I mean. I guess they kind of insinuated it with with who she thought was her dad, that she was an army brat, right? Right. So I don't know if in later episodes they explained that she might have moved around as a kid living with who she thought was her dad. I don't know. But the point is, like, the fact that she's, like, riding a motorcycle is able to spot, like, the different people and kind of piece all that stuff together and then act so quickly. Right. That's true. I didn't think about that. But maybe it's, like, she, you know, her dad... Um, I have his name written down here somewhere. Something Sam Austin, right? We'll we'll get to it eventually. But Sam, Sam he maybe he did take her out and teach her how to track. So maybe he did teach her. Okay, this is you know, watch out for this guy. But like you know, that's a great point though. I mean, if I turned around, I wouldn't be able to go. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> that guy's reading a paper. He's probably a marshal. He probably. You know, Jack. It's almost as if she watched twenty seasons of Lost. <laughs> before she actually started in it in order to pick up on all these details. You know, my son was watching me put together these things for the background here today. And um, I pointed out Kate to him. That's who I was talking about. And he goes, well, who's the star of the show? And I said, it's this guy over here, Jack. And he goes, I thought it was Kate's show. Because <laughs> I guess I've been watching this episode. But um, I was like, uh, well, yeah, yeah, so if you're watching this episode, you would think it's, it's, uh, it's Kate. Yeah. So, but it, it's actually done. It, Jack was the star, but it, it was great ensemble cast, though. It was, mm -hmm. but Jack was definitely the star of the show. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The Marshall Rester. Um, they find, and this is something I remember talking about on the podcast when we first started. They finally get that handcuff off Jin. Lock <laughs> snaps it off. I remember saying, "Why can't they get that stupid handcuff off Jin?" When I saw them clip that, I was like, oh, yeah, they cuffed them. And I was actually thinking about you, Jack, about what you did, and now you told us. <laughs> I, I can remember at the time going, about effing time. Because he wore that – because I, I like when he goes to Michael, like, yeah, remember why I got this on me? Because, you know, we used to hate each other, and now they're like best friends. <laughs> right. I mean, I, that was a great scene. He, he, you know, he gets it off because Locke cuts it off him, and you know, it's like about, about time they got the. It's a good time they had some bolt cutters down there, though. And they, they have everything in the hatch they need. Everything. Uh, Michael asked Locke about the blast doors, and Locke's like, "What?" So we know we know now those blast doors are going to come into play and drive us all crazy once they do. There's gonna there's gonna be a lot of information on those blast doors where we're like, I mean people have sleepless nights reading everything that was on the uh, when Locke got trapped on him. You know the scenes that you just described in terms of where where um, Michael's looking at the interior of the hatch, right? Again, like the first time I watched it, I totally glossed over the fact that he had those you know unique skills in terms right. of engineering. 
and I kind of, I guess they kind of stretched it to not just architecture, but also technology. <laughs> we <We're> trace, <laughs> tracing the cables and everything. Right. And it's like, oh, you know, this guy was actually pretty useful. And I didn't even realize it the first time I watched it. <laughs> no, you, you don't think about it because like you said, he, when the cave, when Jack and Charlie get, or get caught in the cave, they, uh, they bring uh no, that when Jack gets caught in the cave, Michael's saying, no, we got to do it this way because he's he's an engineer. He has engineer training. So, yeah, I mean, Locke, who's I think is a pretty smart guy and pretty observant, he had that look like, wait, what? Glass, glass doors? I wasn't paying attention. I think, I think he was almost offended that he didn't know there were blast doors. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I saw that. What about it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I knew it was there the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the ticket. <laughs> But that was, I mean, that's a great example of like subtle, very subtly dropping those hints. I mean, which we really saw the last few weeks in Watchmen. Right, the exactly. Way, the way that Lindelof, like in the rewatch, you start saying, oh, okay, yeah, they were hinting on all this stuff and showing it to us already. We just yeah, didn't and, know what to look for. And again, it, it, it's it's not just a, a throwaway scene, him saying, talking about the blast doors. It's an important it's important information, especially for us fans down the road. I mean, if it just would have happened, like a lot of shows, out of nowhere, these blast doors would have come down and there had been information on there. But they actually bring it up episodes ahead of time and let us know what's going on. I, I, it's brilliant writing. Well, yeah, and they know he's going to get information maybe from someone that gets into the hatch soon and, you know, how to use the blast doors and all that kind of fun stuff. Exactly. Uh Locke shows Echo and Michael the orientation orientation film. He loves that film. Who doesn't? I use that line. We're gonna have to watch that again so often in on completely unrelated things. I've posted that meme so many times on the J and Jack group that it it, it never gets old. It never gets old. <laughs> it's true. It's one. It's one of those lines where you go. We gotta watch that again. And, and goes, I'm not gonna. Why? Why do I have to watch it again? Why? Why? I'm not even going to try to attempt to pronounce the name of um, the actor who plays Mr. Echo. I'll, I'll but when, yeah, when I first started getting into Lost, I remember at that point in time, there was this whole debate about Echo, if he was dead or not, and if he would return. And I could see that that character had a big fan base, and that was a bit overhyped. But his acting in these scenes, that just that quiet patience and just the the reason he's perfect for these scenes is that not only does he like make like lock weight but he makes everyone who's watching wait because you kind of as a viewer you have a feeling like he's gonna say something important right or he's gonna troll us right <laughs> we're not exactly sure at that point in time but it's like just the command that he has in terms of, I'm assuming this is what happens in the scene, right? Where he then shows the, the piece of film, right? Well, he he he, get, he gets up and he doesn't say anything. Well, oh, we doesn't flash, say anything. Okay. He, no, we flash to Jack and Kate. Kate's like, "What the okay, hell are you sorry, doing?" Sorry, I jumped ahead. Sorry, it's all right. And Kate kisses Jack and then yeah. and then leaves. Yeah. And Jack's like, "I took a shower." Well, what's you know what's going on? Uh, Michael is, is asking Locke about, after he sees the film, he's asking Locke all kinds of questions. Echo just leaves. He just walks away without saying anything. Like you're saying, he just gets up, walks away, and, and Locke's like, okay, all right. I'm not going to stop you. Uh, Sa Saeed talks about, uh, Kate asks Saeed if he believes in ghosts. He goes, well, I saw Walt before Shannon died. And But then Shannon, but Kate didn't ask any questions after that, though. Mm. Wouldn't you? Would, if, if someone told me, "Yeah, I just saw Walt, and Walt's nowhere around," wouldn't you ask? I guess Kate's into herself right now. She has her own issues, and Saeed does too. He's he's in his own he's in his own cone, cone of grief for the greatest love of his life. Right. I'd say Kate's <laughs> reaction to that is probably like, maybe I shouldn't have asked that question. Yeah, yeah you're kind of a downer right now, and I don't I don't yeah. need it. I, I need something positive in my life. Maybe you're she not the not best guy to talk to about this. Yeah, she might not believe Saeed. Like, and then she's like, I don't want to sound like Saeed sounds like now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we go back to it, it's the marshal. They're driving along. He's got his Band-Aid on his nose. And he goes, why now, Kate? Why now? Why'd you kill him now? 
And Kate tells the marshal, uh, he never touched me. And she was very angry about, this is why I think something happened. I, I think he did because she's, she lashes out. She's like, she's, you know, she's trying to convince the marshal that nothing happened to her, that, that he didn't touch her. Which I think if he, if she would, if she did admit it, it would help her case, wouldn't it? I mean, with, I don't know, with the premeditation and all that, uh, you know, going through with the policy and, and setting up the gasoline and, yeah, uh, you know, but it, like I said, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a shameful thing for, for people that have had to go through that and they don't want right. to talk about it or admit it, you know? Right. That's true. So yeah, it just, it signals just how conflicted all this is, right? How emotionally difficult it is for someone to be in a situation like that. And then Kate escapes and sees a black horse as she drives away. So now we see the black horse. And she just kind of looks at it like and the poor marshal is just laying on the ground in the water, on the mud. She jacked him up after, after the car crash too. Yeah. She, she, she uh, knocked him out pretty good. Uh, Locke is explaining the numbers to Michael he goes, so wait, you, you hit this every so every two hours you're you're punching this number. Why? Well, because we uh, you know, the film said we had to. Right? Basically, that's what uh, Locke is saying. Because I thought Michael was pretty, you know, okay, why are you doing this? And Locke really didn't have an answer why. And, and Just Locke, was his faith is he wants to believe. And, and Locke is basically going on Desmond's reaction the very first time the computer was shot. Right. Right. That's true. A good point. You know what I mean? So, you know, and I, you know, when I was started to rewatch the episodes and I was kind of watching them ones I wanted to for this, but then I had to go back and watch other ones to see where we were. I had forgotten because like you said before, I got, because we know what happens. We forgot like the mysteries and the little things we didn't know how important they were. And I mm -hmm. forgot how deep they were into hitting that button. For right. some reason, like yeah. you know, you know, every 108 minutes it has to be done. Even Jack's like, "I'll take care of Sawyer. You take care of the button." Yeah, right. Jack is bought, Jack is bought into it. Yeah, not enough to do it, but unless he already did, I forgot. But you know, but yeah, he man, it, he did it the one the first time, and then everyone is, you know, that's that's what the whole, you know, the DVDs are the flipping 108 picture. You know, right. So you know, I forgot how deep we are into the unnumbered. So, we, I mean, when 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 the show was airing, and I remember one thing that Jack would always say on the podcast, and it actually rubbed me the wrong way at that time, was he would always refer to Locke as a sucker. And I mean, it's it's kind of a it's probably the right term, but it's a bit extreme. I mean, to me, it really just shows that, it, like, the character Locke while he was alive and and all his flashbacks is the person who wants to believe in something, right? And well, he, um, I think he, I think well, he needs to believe in something. He needs to believe in something. And he's more like, I, I really equate him to like somebody who, you know, would actually sign up for any multi-level marketing type, <laughs> type uh, opportunity. Like, because like, if the person who's approaching him like is like charismatic enough. And so that for him, the, the Island itself that, which has given him his ability to walk again. Right. Right. In many ways is like that multi-level marketer who's like pulling him into the, into the pyramid. Right. And right. you can see like the way that he's trying to pull other people with him in, right. The way that he makes Boone climb. Right. Right. <laughs> it's like, he's, He's like a recruiter on the next level of the pyramid. And so that like, I think about those, this, that scene from late, late season one, where they see the light go on in the hatch right? at the moment where he's like about to lose faith. Right. And it's almost like a sign. It's a divine sign of divine intervention. So that like, once they get in there, it's, you know, it's just, it, it's pure faith at that point in time right. and making sure that other people believe as well. well and so know, the, the contrast to that in that scene is, and it's, it's almost like a throwaway scene, but it's, 
I think incredibly important rewatch is the way that Walt, um, sorry, Michael reacts in that he's asking all these really logical scientific questions like, okay, so what happens when you press this button? What happens if you don't press this button? And he's actually looking at all the cabling and everything. And he's like, <laughs> is there purpose for any of this stuff? Right. Well, well, Locke said, he goes, he didn't, you know, he said, what's, what happens? You don't put, well, we don't know. Because they don't know, he, you know, they just say there was an incident. There's something, something might happen. But you said Locke. Like I said I always called him a sucker because well he was. I mean he he he, you know his dad stole his kidney. His mom used him. He it's not his fault. It's it's his upbringing. That's why I say his flashbacks are the most important on the show. And people say oh I, I no his flashbacks are the most important on the show because well, it, I mean, it, it, really defines, <laughs> it really it really defines who he is and why he does what he does on the island. But it's also, mm -hmm. but it's also like it's like you said, it's the most, it's the biggest sea change in anyone's life as soon as they get there. Right. Like he's in a wheelchair on the plane. They crash. He's standing. Like just like that. So of course but, he's going to have the most faith of anybody about the island and what it can do. But he was given a second chance. We know that he was he is the most capable person to survive on that island. Mm -hmm. he, he's smart. He's knowledgeable. He can walk now. He was training for a walkabout, and everything's going pretty much Locke's way. He's he's we're thinking, okay, this guy's. I want this guy in my corner. He sees the smoke monster. The smoke monster shows him something beautiful, and suddenly he becomes. I got to do something for the island. Boone dies. <laughs> I, oh well, he was the sacrifice the island wanted, and I think that's where Jack starts losing it with him because he goes because his action. Mm -hmm. He lied about it. What happened with uh, Boone? Then he tells Boone, well, that was just what the island de demanded, and Jack's looking. What are you talking about? You know, but that Locke is so into, like you said, Eckhart, he's so into what the island that he, 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 again, he starts losing his focus on what life is about, really, I think. Right. And what's amazing about that is, and the way that you described it, is that they were able to layer like several stories into one person. The story of the sucker, the story of the almost like born again convert, but also the almost like a redemption story in terms of like, being able to walk again in many ways, a redemption right. story. And I think, and you, most of us that were watching Lost were all focused on the fact that this old guy who was walking was a badass, right? And we missed yeah. those other layers. And um, again, kudos to Lindelof and Cues for being able to insert like several things into one avatar and then allowing the viewer to decide which one they wanted to focus on. <laughs> Yeah, amazing character. I mean, he, 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 the show doesn't work without Locke. I, I oh no, no, yeah. There's, there's just no way. I mean, you ha you have to have his character because he's so he's so important, and, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he's likable too. You want to root for him. I mean, mm -hmm. you see his backstory where he's he's sitting at the airport. They don't have the wheelchair for him. They have to carry him on the plane. He's just thinking, "Oh my god, this is just." And later on, when we find out why he's in the wheelchair, it's even more heartbreaking. I mean, they did, they did such a great job of making us feel sorry for this guy and also wanted to say, wake up, you know, it's just, but I, I it's, um, again, I, I say it's over and over again, amazing storytelling. Just, and that, and it makes it even, even more sadder when you find out that what actually happened to him is what actually happened to him. Right. You know, the man, John Locke himself. Yeah. You know, so that makes it sad too. But, but it's, it's just, he it just, he's so, I mean, later on, Another thing that screws him up is we'll, we'll you know, skip, skipping ahead here, when uh, um, Ben gets in his life, Ben just really, I'm Ben, Ben just messes with him. I don't think he was ever the same. He was, he was, Smoke Monster messed him up. Ben pushed him over the cliff. I think Ben just was so, did such a great job of getting into uh, uh, Locke's head that he just, he just destroyed the poor guy. Hmm. But. Uh, we got a scene where uh, uh, Jack is chopping wood. Hurley walks up and and says, uh, "Yeah, so Rose's husband is white. Didn't see that coming." You know, kind of breaking the ice. Another, another funny scene. But I think Hurley actually said, "So uh, he's kind of you know he figured out why you know because well Sawyer usually chops the wood, but now you're chopping the wood." And of course, Jack with his bedside manner. So what are you a psychiatrist now? Well, no, but uh, I think I'm making sense. And I, I think he was, I think Hurley was spot on. Sure. By the way, when he makes the comment about, about Bernard being white, 
I always felt like this is like where they're starting to break the third wall. <laughs> where it's like he's not just talking to Jack, he's talking to the viewers there, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point because because I think Hurley was always the one that people thought was talking to the audience. He explained, you know, he yeah. was explaining to the fans and, and and all that different stuff. Um, Kate talks with Sun and she asks if uh, if she can watch. Uh, Sun goes, "Well, can you watch uh, Sawyer?" And she's like, "Yeah, maybe." But then she she doesn't get close to Sawyer this time. She stays back because I think she still thinks it's Wayne, right? <laughs> An avatar for him, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Kate sees, I uh, goes to see uh, Sergeant Sam Austin, her dad, and I thought this was a pretty, this is a pretty emotional scene. I thought, you know, because she's, she always believed that he was her dad, his, her biological dad, and she finds out that Wayne was her by, and it's just like, oh my god, I, I got him in me, I got his, because she could probably always say, okay, he's just my stepdad, I don't have his. I don't have his biological. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't have his DNA. I'm not him. I'm not bad. But then when she finds out that she is, she has his DNA. I think that was a lot for her to handle. Especially if he was trying to abuse her all the time. I mean, right. That, that, yeah. le that levels it up a hundred percent. You know what I mean? So, and, but even, even her, uh, her dad, when he's like, you know, I, I wanted to take you with me. Your mom wouldn't let me take you. And, He's tearing up. She's tearing up. And she says, I think she says, well, you know, I got to call this in. Can you give me an hour? Sure. Thanks. I think she says, thanks, daddy. Right. Yeah. I mean, she's he she still considers him, you know, the person that raised her. Right. Yeah, I thought her father. that was actually one of, of um, Evangeline Lilly's best scenes in the entire series. Sure. Yeah, it was it was it was, uh, you know, I've, I think we've obviously seen it a few times. But it's just like it chokes me up because you can you can mm -hmm. feel you can feel the emotion, and actually both of them. I mean, you, you feel like they're they're really struggling with what's going on. He's like, "Oh my god, you know you're," and she's he's probably thinking, "Oh my god, you are, you have Wayne in you," yeah, because he says something about because she asked, "Why didn't you do it?" And he goes, "I don't have murder in my heart," which I think just you know crushes her i think it because it it it's because yeah i'm i'm i become i'm wayne i don't think she is but i think in her state of mind that right there i think she thinks that she's like her biological dad i you know and this scene also really spoke to me about you know goes back to you know having kids watching this differently now it's like that question of you know did jeffrey dahmer's parents know growing up like you know what i mean like you know your kid, you know, if there's, you would think you would know deep down if there was something amiss or, you know, it, it's difficult to talk about. You know what I mean? Like, right. like it's a deep thing to know that your daughter could kill someone and you can recognize that in her. Right. Probably because you're doing all this training in the woods to turn her into a master tracker. I don't know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you haven't seen Dexter, that is the premise behind Dexter. I've seen some of that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's actually what, you know, he knows, and I won't spoil people, but he knows, and he, he knows that Dexter probably is going to go down a dark path and he trains him to do something for, well, you got to watch it. I, it, I, it. First four or five seasons are excellent, but don't, don't finish it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil Dexter for anyone. Lumberjack. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That ended great. Uh, but we find out Echo. We and again, not it's not a throwaway scene because when they when they, they find that box in in the hatch, they find a Bible, they find an, a glass eye, and inside the Bible is film that's messing from the orientation film. Now I forgot at this point in time. Did is this the first time the viewer sees that the film was in the Bible? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, I, because I believe, we, we know there's a Bible, but I don't think we knew there was film in there. The way that he builds the tension as he's telling the story. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Locke's like, okay. Yeah, that's all of us. <laughs> yeah. We were all Locke, even you, Jack, at that point in time. And well, I, yeah, I, have, I have his haircut, so I'm, I'm cool. <laughs> I had a very hard time connecting the story to – it was a very dramatic priestly way of presenting the film, you know. 
Well, I, I think it was, it was Echo's way of saying that, you know, things happen for a reason, because I, I think even Locke says, what are the odds of, you know, this film being missing? It's you find it, we find each other, and, you know, you're on the other side of the island and all this sort of stuff. It's just, a, again, great storytelling. The I mean, reason I, why it stuck with me is that in many ways it showed, and sorry that I jumped in, Ethan, is that um, the show had enough room and margin in it that they could put in these artistic flourishes for the sake of putting them in. Because they evidently at this point in time when they were working with them that they realized this guy had an amazing delivery. I mean, yeah, he I just the actor has an amazing voice. So it's like, let's write something for him that's almost um, a that we can insert in there and that can just raise the tension and we'll really like show like add more gravitas to this character before we give the full backstory. I mean, yeah, they're definitely teeing him up for the next episode. Um, right. and you know, and with the most important line, I think of the episode, which is don't mistake coincidence for fate. Right. Where he <laughs> says to, to, you know, that's to me, that's almost the whole episode right there is him telling John Locke that. It's like mm -hmm. I get I get where you're coming from, but your head's your head's a little bit up your ass. Let's let's <laughs> you know let's get back to reality a little bit. <laughs> but that's a lot. And though, and right? it also sets up it also sets up that interesting dynamic that they were starting to build in terms of like rival factions of faith. Right. Right. Like even within the man of science, man of faith, they were starting to build build up like two rival factions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But then a lock is splicing the film together. He goes, "Okay, now we gotta go watch it." And and I like the fact that it, it keeps mentioning, "Don't use the computer for personal use. Don't use the comp computer for personal use." And you know, you got Michael in there. He's inspecting the cables and all this different stuff. All of a sudden, what happens on the screen? You know, someone starts talking. He's well. Hold, Jack, Jack, Jack. I hit interrupt. I think you skipped where Sawyer goes out with Kate to see the horse. Oh yeah, I did. I did do that. I'm yeah. sorry. Just but he, well, he does. He's like, well, he thinks, oh, have we been rescued? And he's thinking, okay, I'm in this great place. There's a kitchen. There's food. There's there's everything. And he goes out. He goes out. Sees sees he's still on the same island. Goes, Son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. <laughs> funny. But he sees the horse, which makes Kate. I'm not crazy. There is a horse there. Right. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> But she seemed to be in a better mood after that. She goes, oh, you need a haircut. And she's very playful with Sawyer. He's not trying to kill her anymore. You know, I was looking at rankings of episodes, and this one is always low. This is low. This is in the 90s or 80s or something for this. And it's called What Kate Did. And it's ad as advertised. It's, it's what she did. Right. And a lot of people complain about the horse. I think the horse is kind of important to her story. Um. Uh, yeah, I just don't think it deserves to be as low as it is. I, I love it. Yeah. I, 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 I don't understand the hate for yeah. Kate, this one. I get the, I get later down the road. I, I, I can kind of see people's points, but I always, I always like Kate. I guess she could be annoying, but I, I always enjoyed her character. Couldn't make up her mind, but, uh, uh, then we see Anna Lucia. She's carving a stick. Like she needs another weapon. And uh, Jack brings her a drink, and he knew he, he remembered the drink that she ordered in the uh, airport. I, I got to give him kudos for that because I, unless it was something simple, you know, like a beer, I probably couldn't remember how much someone was drinking in an airport. People remember what's important to them, Jack. That's true, and I guess I, guess I just I, I don't have a great memory, so maybe that's a problem. <laughs> uh, then, then we go back to Lock Echo watching the the uh, entire film, and that's when Michael's on the computer. Uh, it's going back and forth, and the co producer says hello. He says hello, and then also you see, and he says Michael, and it goes Dad? Question mark. Boom. Now, when they're so watching, when they're watching the film after they added the pieces, um, I should have paid more attention when I watched this yesterday. The piece that they added in there does mention something about the interaction with another hatch, right? Yeah, the whole piece of the film is all about don't use this computer for anything else, specifically communication. That's all the entire missing splice film is about. 
it could lead to another incident. I think it's it's. What but it, to say. it doesn't insinuate that they're being monitored by another hatch, right? No, no, no that's later. I think I do remember saying though I, on the podcast, I, I I did say they're probably being monitored by another hatch. That someone's probably watching them. Because it just because to that me, was it, what it, my... it, it, it didn't make sense. I mean, I, I know at that time they're trying to get the mystery that Walt has this these powers and all that different stuff. I'm not like going. Eh, I'm not buying it. I think someone's watching them. But it's one of the few times I was right. Uh, <laughs> overall, I know I know we just said we loved the episode, but what was your final thoughts on the on the episode? Go ahead. Well, I mean, I think it's it, the way that you paired these two episodes is really good because they do link into each other very well. Obviously, the first one is mostly focused on Kate. I thought that was good. And tying into a bigger theme that we discovered and or decided to talk about in this episode, you know, a lot of these early um, flashbacks are about, you know, the negative things that happened in the past. And putting that in contrast to the way that they're acting on the island right and um, and really how this these become you know redemption stories from the past and trying to move on so you know up until this point in time you know who knows what the image that people had of Kate but you know if you watch that verbatim you have a lot of compassion for her as a character right you would think so, so. being able to overcome these things so that was the way I came away from it. You know, I think it would be more of a redemption story if she killed a bus full of nuns or something, just because, <laughs> or, you know, either, either on purpose by accident, just because it's like, okay, yes, um, I would have, you know, I think it's very relatable to try to want to hurt someone that's hurting someone that is close to you. Um, so it doesn't seem that bad what, what she did what Kate did. Right. You know, especially because Wayne is, is garbage. Wayne, 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 unholy Wayne is total garbage. Right. And he could be your father and he could be abusing her in horrible ways. And, you know, he got what he deserved. If we could say that. And, uh, you know, I don't feel bad. It seems like her biggest crime now is being a fugitive and not actually what she did. Right, that's true, and because she does some other things later, you know, she did some other things later on that made the situation worse. Right. I mean, I think that what I was thinking about it more in terms of was, you know, on the island, she's one of the leaders, and she acts as a generally helpful and positive force for the group. Right. And you contrast that against her experience in childhood, which could have left her being incredibly cynical and spent probably portion of her adult life when she was on the run not trusting anybody right so the fact that she's that that didn't completely seep into her soul and that she's able to be the positive force that she's at the island is something that was i think probably completely missed by most of us watching it yeah well you make a great point because her mom obviously her mom threw her under the bus i mean here she did everything for her mom and again you know her mom again i could see her being upset, but I, I, I don't know. Not that my kids would do something like that. They wouldn't have to do something like that. I don't know. But it's just, I, I don't think I would go on something like that. No, I'm not going to throw you under the bus. And, and I think this contrast that I'm trying to make would have been more pronounced in more of an HBO setting because <laughs> the, the HBO setting would have really emphasized how difficult her childhood was. Right. And, and made and, that and, contrast even stronger. And it's, it's got to be because the man she thought of as her dad and believed to be her dad, she obviously spent didn't spend a lot of time with him all the because they were they were separated because of the, you know, she was living with Wayne and stuff. So how much time did she actually spend with Sam Austin opposed to Wayne? Uh, we don't know, really, do we? Yeah, we don't. So no. and that, that, that's a big deal because you're you have someone who's a, a good influence in your life. And someone who's not, if you're spending a time around a person that's not all the time, that's gonna, that it's, it's, it, we see it all the time. It's real life. I mean, this is, that's what makes loss as good as it is because these are real life issues. Mm -hmm. These are things that actually happen. Unfortunately, these are things that actually happen in life. So, 
I don't know. But I was thinking, you know, you, uh, Ethan, you mentioned how what Kate did it always gets kind of a a bad review or bad stuff. Is it because it follows the twenty third Psalm? Is the, the show that follows it, which is just <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it's just it's a it's a it's an amazing. Like what Kate did is I love what Kate did. This episode is amazing. And there's and and there's so many like he. Like I already said, there's so many good contrasts to these episodes. They're perfect together to talk about. So, right. You know. Well, I wanted to say too. I, go ahead. Sorry. The last thing I wanted to say about this, this, this Kate storyline, which I guess I just thought of that. This might also be kind of, I mean, Sawyer was already starting to act, you know, human, more of a team, more, more, less, less <laughs> sociopathic, right? Right, but I'm wondering if like the influence that Kate has on him, in many ways, is what was helping him make that turn. Because I mean, if you think about it, they probably did have similar um, difficult childhoods, and um, Kate Bobby from Gale. the beginning, on the island on the island was you know team player, right? right, leading by example. And Sawyer was just like, "F you guys, I want all the stuff that's on the plane." We right. talked earlier in the rewatch. Um, it was a Sawyer backstory where you see where he's he gets tortured by Saeed and you know all the different stuff going on. And instead of just telling the truth, you know he didn't he didn't have the inhalers. He wanted to bring everyone down to his level. He wanted everyone to be feel like crap. He wanted everyone to feel hate. He, he want that's what made him feel good as people because he was he just you know obviously what happened to him his his dad kills his mom and then kills himself on the bed that he's hiding under. That's traumatic. I don't know how anyone survives that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, at seven years old, I mean, that's just, oh, my God, how do you do that? But I, the more you watch his backstories, it, you can see that he's he just wants people to feel. That's why in this episode, we'll get to it later on, but he has trouble when people are being nice to him. He doesn't know how to handle it. He doesn't know how to handle it when people are saying, hey, I miss you, buddy. I'm glad you're back. He's like, uh, whatever, Pillsbury. You know, he, he's, he's still trying to be angry. He still wants people to be like you said, he's becoming more of a team. He's slowly, I mean, we saw different moments, like when Michael and, and Jen were fighting, he's one of the guys, him and Saeed are the ones that rushed to break it up, which always shocked me, because that's not something I would think Sawyer would do. Right. But there is a guy in there with a heart. He does have a heart. And this is what the island is kind of doing. This is what the list of people are brought there for, you know, broken people that can somehow be fixed by being here and get a shot at redemption because they might have to end up running the show at the end. Right. right. That's true. Um, going to the 23rd Psalm, I, I do like to point out this. I, I got to actually go on the tour. I, I've seen different parts of uh, where they shot and the soccer scene in Africa always shocks me because where they, sh it looks like Hawaii, but when you see it on TV, it looks like well, that could be Africa. It's just the it's just, it's the the uh, movie magic or TV magic. I just said because when we first saw it, I go, "This is where they shot it." There's no way this is where they shot it, but the way that you know the way the shooting and the angles and all the different stuff. And but the bad guys show up, and a young boy is asked to kill somebody, and we know it's Yemi now. And the older boy goes just gets in there and boom, does it. So it, when we find out it's Mr. Echo. And they take him, right? Yeah, they take him. And you know, he's never he's never the same again. Um because you see you see on Island Echo, and he has morals. He has he has um he has a code. And but you see off island echo, and you know he's but then when I was rewatching this, I go, okay. Because I was saying, I, I said, I don't know if it was the last episode or the episode before I said, did they do a great job of of showing Echo on the island first before we see his backstory, because if we saw his backstory, would we have as much, would we care as much about him as we do on the island? If we saw the backstory where he's slitting people's throats, he's running drugs, he's killing people, he's got no soul, according to, was it, was it, was it, was it another, was a fantastic job of how they set Echo's storyline up? Uh, by showing, oh, like, it's the, great. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ethan. You take the first. I was just going to say, I mean, it's great the way, you know, the first 48 days did all that, right? Right. Yeah. First 48 days and then uh, some of Collision. You just really got a picture of the man before you see where he was, which is 
no. Well, he's going in. He's going in retrieving. He takes the two children to uh, to Libby. Say, can you watch the children? And he's going in and retrieving the dead bodies out of the water. I mean, this is the guy. You, if you saw the, if you saw this, if this had been the first, this flashback had been the first. Well, why is he doing that? That's not. That's that would be out of character for me, I would think. But I, I guess the way they did it was just was just perfect. I guess Eckhart. Yeah, no, I agree. I like the fact that they. <laughs> They they introduced the character as somebody who, you know, was respectable first, right? And then the the twist is this guy was a complete thug. Yeah, he was. A and so it killer. does it, again. It emphasizes you know a certain aspect of the redemption story on the island. But and as we'll get to in this episode, we can see how like that calm and collected exterior starts to break apart right as he starts he, learning more about what's going on here yeah he he's he's uh, you can see yeah like you're saying it you see off island echo a little bit especially when he picks up charlie and put, pins him up against the tree but uh uh i like he's talking he's talking well, he's writing on his jesus stick and then Claire is talking to Echo about Aaron. He's talking about how Aaron was uh, Moses' son, a brother, and how the double, uh, it was just, how, why'd you pick that? And she goes, did she say why she picked the name Aaron? Yeah, it, she just liked it or something. She just like liked that. the name, yeah, right? She just liked the name, yeah. And then uh, Claire tells up, uh, you know, you should talk to Charlie. You seem like a religious man. You should talk to Charlie. He's always carrying around this uh, Virgin Mary statue. Charlie. Yeah, and she goes. And the goes, eyes just light up. <laughs> Yeah, right. and I can remember, I can, I can remember this episode it was like I, I was like okay, how the hell? Because Charlie even says I think we're in the South Pacific, that's uh, Africa. How the, I I can remember going. There's no way this could have possibly. There's no way that plane had enough fuel to make it to the island. There's no way. It's just one of those things we're lost, mess with our minds and our our you know for all that stuff. But uh, Echo smashes the statue. There's heroin inside it, and Claire goes, huh. It has heroin. Delicious, delicious heroin. <laughs> uh, going back to... By the way, it. I just want to mention that when 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 um, she starts talking, I couldn't help but hear Jay's terrible imitation of her. <laughs> More baby! Like, like, it's like, I actually can't watch these episodes without remembering like the actual... <laughs> it's not... It's not... It's Jay not Jack it, commentary. Yeah. You can't separate them anymore, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I have the same problem when she goes when she says "my baby." Anytime she says it, I, I hear Jay going "my baby." It's it's like, burn, it's like burned into my brain. The other thing that was difficult to watch was like kind of separating her from, of course, um, Khaleesi from Game of Thrones, right? Yeah, they are kind of similar, right? Uh, I mean, they have like similar built, similar facial structure, similar accents. So. <laughs> Khaleesi was a little stronger, though. She was a little, uh... but a bit, a bit more crazy. Well, he, yeah, and even in the end, yeah. Well, she did. She didn't have a squirrel baby. She, maybe she. Yeah, if she, would have a, uh, she would have a dragon. <laughs> she would have had a dragon squirrel baby, right? If we had that eighth episode, that would have been that. Okay. <laughs> um, Locke and Michael are talking, and Locke's resetting the uh, the the combination of the lock, uh, the safe. And he, he's making good points. He goes, "Well, there's a lot of new people here. We got to limit who gets the guns, who doesn't get the guns." Which obviously would take. I, I. It's almost one of those things, though. But who's who's deciding who who gets the guns, who doesn't get the guns, right? Do they have a? I mean, I guess the log carrying people don't care, but they don't really have a say. But I. I mean, if I wasn't allowed to go, in, I mean, you don't see they ever see them going in the hatch, right? No, no, no! You, no one had a hatch pass except for like five or six people. Yeah, they don't get a shower. They don't get the uh, wash their clothes. I mean, Jack, why would they go into the hatch? I mean, they don't need logs in the hatch. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> they have electricity there. <laughs> You're taking my job away. That's the only thing I, I do is carry the logs around. <laughs> well, they needed the logs to for that fire, right? That they kept burning on the beach as a signal, right? Right, that's true. That's true. At some that's point, log carrying guys employed. At, <laughs> at one point, they let Libby in to get that blanket, right? Right. No, that, right. Was, that was a mistake. Depends on so how you, you gotta, feel, but we're not there yet. Yeah. Um, 
Echo comes, uh, Charlie and uh, Charlie singing why Jin's trying to fish and Jin oh, thanks. Yeah, Char Charlie's like, oh, thanks, uh, my voice. I, and, and Jin's like, I go, I, you're scaring the fish away. Shut up, you know, stop singing. But then Echo comes storming in for, and I, that would have scared me. Scary, very scary. He's a big guy. He's carrying around a Jesus stick. He's 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 pretty muscular. I, I would I would be like, okay, well, whatever you want. And he's not looking for anybody else. He's looking for you. You, yeah. It's like, what did I do? What did I do? And he even tells Jin, "This does not concern you." And yeah. Jin goes, "Yeah, you're right. I'm out of here." Because Jin usually, because Jin's had that. Well, the episode was the episode of Collision, where he punches he punches uh, uh, Echo, and Echo punches him back, and it doesn't end well for Jin. It's like uh, that was a mistake. Don't don't make Echo mad. Just. Just do what he wants. But then we go to an older Echo, and he's talking to a drug dealer. And he says, yeah, you give me 50. I'll give you 50. Give me 50,000. I'll get your drugs off the island. And they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. He's going to fly him in a plane, you know, with the missionaries. and the. But then he goes, I, what I've heard about you is true. You have no soul. And he takes his knife, and he slits the throats of two, uh, two guys. He Just, showed them. Yeah. But that's where, like I said, if you would have saw that scene and then you see Echo on the island, it's like, okay, this guy, he does have no soul. But on the island, he he's a different guy. But but he yeah, doesn't I mean, want that. Thing, yeah. No, go ahead. What jumped up jumped out at me was the the way that he's delivering his solution to the problem, right? In many yeah. ways, was not too different from his soliloquy in terms of the prior episode with the temple. Right, and you yeah. can see like the same personality is already embedded in there. And of course, the first time we see it, we think, okay, this guy is like has a lot of faith, right? And and he might have faith at that point in time, but you know, before that part of his personality or brain or soul, like was dedicated to something else, which was purely for survival, right? As a thug. And he's like, or or to, to 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 be opportunistic, right? To be opportunistic. And so that side of him that we see in the drug dealer's meeting where he's coming up with the solution, I think that side is what starts coming out more and more and more after this episode. Or even during that's, that's a good point. Ethan. Uh I just feel like, you know, it was weird, like they said he has no soul. He kills the two guys, but immediately says he doesn't kill the child that's there with the guys it says, go back and tell your friends that I let you live. Right. Which, you know, he wants to be seen as a certain way, but his actions show that that's not the way he is. He is. But do you think he sees himself in the child? Because uh, his life, his echo's life was taken away from him. Right. He, he wasn't a killer until he was forced to be a killer. Right. Sure. And so he had, like Eckhart said, he has to be a certain way because if you're in this, you can't show weakness. You have to have no soul because they'll sniff weakness and, and you'll be killed. Sure. So I think he saw, I think he saw the child and said, yeah, just, uh, I think he sees himself in the, in the child. Yeah. But it also, it also does fit a certain archetype of, of, of a criminal, you know, mob, mob boss type figure where it's not a hundred percent consistent. Like there'll be these really weird wrinkles in the personality where they'll like support certain charities. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you got to get to heaven, right? Any way you can. Um, then Claire comes back. Uh, Claire calls Charlie out for the drugs. Charlie said, I didn't know. I didn't know there were drugs in there. It's a case. How am I supposed to know there's drugs in there? But we know Charlie knows there's drugs in there. Uh, Locke is teaching Michael how to use a gun and wasting ranch dressing. Yeah, at exactly. An alarming rate. Yeah, it's, you couldn't find an empty can or something like that. Not on that island. <laughs> well, yeah, Dharma. Well, I guess the Dharma beer wasn't found until years later, right? I don't know. Just I, I'm like you. I was like, you only have so much food. Yeah, did right? they know yet that the sure. drop drops were coming? No. Okay. No. Then the only logical explanation is that they expect it to be rescued at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> or just Locke doesn't like ranch dressing. Right? He's not a fan. 
So he has it blown up. Uh, Charlie lies to Echo about where he found the statue. I found it here, this tree right here. And Echo knows Charlie's lying. He, and Echo's like, I don't have to do this. I mean, Charlie goes, you don't know me. What do you? And, and Echo picks him up. And then now you're starting to see older Echo, off-island Echo, where he picks him up and just and you see the fear in Charlie's face. It's like, okay, yeah, I guess I, I got to stop lying to this guy. It's a, it's a bad move on my part. Charlie's been pretty arrogant the past two episodes and annoying a little bit. Yeah, that's true. But he can be that way. He can be that way. Right. Yeah. Uh, Echo asks uh, why he lied to Claire. He's, well, I don't have to. I don't have to explain things to you. I don't have to interrogate me. And but then Echo sees the smoke monster for the first. He hears it. Does he hear it? He sees. He, he saw it. He, see, he? he sees it a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, I mean uh, that was actually really good. That, that was shot really well because they show that like he sees it like with his peripheral perception. Right. Um, and they're really insinuating, like with that, that he. Uh, and I'm not even sure if Charlie sees it. Does Charlie, Ethan, does Charlie Charlie didn't he didn't react. No. Yeah. So we're really showing that, like, they're really emphasizing that Echo has these like heightened senses, almost like Locke in ways, right? <laughs> Somewhat. Uh, Yami, the priest, his brother, was now a priest. Ask Echo, what are you doing here? And of course, Echo's, he's got a plan. He's, and I, I don't know, was it a bad deal? He's like, okay, because you have the lady outside selling the statues and they're trying to raise mo money for a, po a polio vaccine. Was that what it was? I some, didn't write it some down. Va some vaccine. Um, Maybe malaria, probably. <laughs> but he, he, uh, he wants to use Yemi to get the, the drugs out. And he goes, I thought he made a good case. He goes, no, I'm trying to get the drugs out of Africa. Right? And Yemi just doesn't doesn't believe in it. He goes, I mean, you think he believes him, but he's like, to me, I thought Echo, I kind of agreed with Echo on this. They're going to get the money for the vaccine. The drugs will be out of Africa, so the young kids won't be getting hooked on the drugs. It'll be someone else's problem. Right? <laughs> Like Robert so, Redford and Meryl Streep's, right? Yeah. So, but but again, is this is this not a good plan? No, I mean, if your plan is to get your brother to use his Red Cross plane to do it, I think it is a bad plan. Okay, uh, all right, you know. And I was, get, just, I was I was just looking at the whole picture, maybe. I mean, <laughs> so, I mean. It, it, it shows his opportunistic streak and it, I mean, it's clever. And again, I think they're showing that like, this is a guy who's cerebral, right? He's not just the guy who's reciting this passage from the Bible in the prior episode right. or biblical story. This is a guy who can like see different pieces and form a mosaic and, and do something. So I think that's the purpose they were doing it. But of course, from a writer's perspective, the way it probably went down was they knew they needed to explain. They had the plane already from season one, right? And they wanted right. to tie that into the Echo story. So how do they do that, right? <laughs> yeah. So in, in many ways, his like his opportunistic plan mirrors what the writers were facing in the sense that they're like, how do we connect Echo to the plane in the jungle, right? <laughs> And how do we drive the how do we drive the listeners not the listeners the people viewing this show crazy? Because again, right, exactly. it, it never it never made sense. I've been like going until the end when you figure out okay, there could have been this you know the, all the different stuff going on. But it's like no, this plane does not have enough fuel to travel that far. There's no way. So, but I mean, Jack, at that point in time, again, I wasn't as I wasn't as involved until later. Wouldn't somebody just say, look, we don't know where this island is, right? We right. know that the plane crashed and that it probably was in some sort of storm, but we don't know like where that storm was and where this island is and what type of transportation happened between those two points, right? And I think so that, I think that did come. I think that did was a lot of people had that theory that you know we don't know where the island is. Kind of like almost it's like a wormhole type, to borrow a term from sci-fi. I mean, right. Ethan, isn't that how you would explain it if somebody described lost to you? How did the plane get there? Probably a wormhole. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, before, like if you, before if after you've never season, watched, yeah. 
if you'd never watched Lost and somebody explained to you like what happens in season one, season two, you're probably like, okay, these planes probably entered a wormhole somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They went to where the 2% went. It just, I don't know. It's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know. It's deep space nine. It's right there. It's at the station. It's, <coughs> you know, me. right. <laughs> Later on, they flip but, that and it moves, but you know, yeah. But the, the, the point is, I think, I mean, uh, to be blunt, that didn't bother me that much. I, I loved it as like this. Yeah, like dr- drove, drove me crazy. Because like there was enough stuff that was going on the island that was like surrealistic and magical where it's, like, I'll just go with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you do have to make that stretch in these shows. And this is the kind of show that like, that like trained me to do it. Like, you yeah. know. Well, like you say, it was magical because you have. We talked about Locke being able to walk again. Things that shouldn't happen are happening on this island. So yeah, it is a magical place. So that I think that was what most people concluded. But I, I was still like, I don't know, I don't get it. And I think, and I th- actually think this is an important point because you mentioned BSG before, right? And I think in most sci-fi shows that people have watched up to this point in time. You know, there's stuff that happens in there that doesn't happen in our reality, but that reality of the sci-fi world is pretty consistent, right? That's like true, the, yeah. the, the rules that are different are pretty consistent, right? And what Lost was doing is it was showing a world that was purportedly our world. We weren't sure. But most of the rules were the same, but then there were like glitches, which is why, of course, one of the first theories was that it was a simulation, right? Right. Um, or that it was like the, the what is it called uh, Dante's Inferno or whatever, right? Something like that, right? Where there were things that were like ninety nine percent real, and that one percent that wasn't real was the stuff that jumped out to us. I know one of my first theories was it was an experiment that the, the plane crash was staged. That the <laughs> they just woke up thinking they were in a plane crash. That this, there was an experiment, experiment going on that. These how these people would live together because they all came from different cultures, different you know uh, ways of life. All the all the, everything was di- they weren't from the same little you know they weren't from Mayberry RFD. You know they were they weren't from the same place. They were from all over the world. How would they get along? Almost like almost like so the the show it was kind of based on Survivor that you throw all these people in here. How do they get along? How yeah. do they cope? You know how do they work together. That was what I thought. And then of course, another 48 days, you actually see the plane crash. You go, okay, that, that theory was, got trashed and I'm moving on to the next theory. But anyway, it was, uh, there were so many theories that you look back now and go, God, those, those were, you know, not that mine, but you have, those were great ideas, but then they, it turns out it wasn't what was going on. Well, and, and, and just one more point why I love, and I'll go back to this later, why I like season five so much is they're able to tie that stuff in with the time travel. You see this plane crash, in that season. Right. You know, I love that stuff. Yeah. It's, 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 they, again, keep saying it, but they do an amazing job. It's just great. Great, great show. Um, we see Kate is giving Sawyer a haircut and they're kind of cutesy and they're playing around and they're, they're having a good time. And this is where we talk about where Hurley goes, Hey, glad you're back. And he goes, like I said early, whatever Pillsbury. And then Michael goes, glad you made it. Glad you're all right. And he goes, yeah, he literally doesn't know how to, he doesn't know how to take, Someone being nice to him. He hey, Jack, handle. I've got a question for you. Mm-hmm. In these scenes, when you hear Sawyer talk, like, does part of you like imagine what he would sound like if this was more of a Deadwood type script? <laughs> 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 like, I can't help but like, like seeing like subtitles that are actually in Deadwood speak whenever he talks now. <laughs> Again, it would have to be on HBO, right? It and I could do an be, imitation, it, and it would have to be on HBO. Yeah, it, it could be on ABC, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> have uh, Al Swergen uh, be the uh, play Sawyer, right? He basically is like a character <laughs> off Deadwood. He is. He, he is. He, he has that kind of mentality where he doesn't care about anything. But even Al, in the first part, getting way off topic here, Deadwood Al is a terrible guy. He's a terrible guy throughout the show, but he's less terrible because yeah. they bring in Cy Tolliver, who's even worse than Al. <laughs> I think that's why they brought him in to because I said, you know, we want Al to be a little likable. 
Is so. there one? Is there one monologue on Lost that comes anywhere near close to any of those? Cy Tolliver <laughs> or Al Swearingen at the end of the night? You know what I mean? No dialogues. Is there anything like that on Lost ever? Mm, no, those are complete. No, that's, that's that's brilliant. If yeah. they had it, like Sawyer would have given it. <laughs> <laughs> he would. But uh, uh, that's true. I. Maybe they should do that one tape. Take an episode I mean, <laughs> and and switch the dialogue around. And I'm sure it's, it's probably on YouTube somewhere, right? Sawyer, Sawyer, Sawyer. I could hear Sawyer <laughs> going around talking about Euclid Avenue. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, Michael. But Michael says to Kate, "Hey, I, I hear you got uh, uh, hatch duty. Can I have your shift?" Juice. Yeah. Okay. Sure. You want it? Yeah. I'll take it. Um, Sawyer's not, uh, we talked about that. Um, Echo sees um, a parachute in the tree, finds a dead body. And he looks right away and, and Charlie's like, what are you doing? But he's looking for the cross, right? He's looking for Yemi's cross. But he knows he, he sees the gold tooth, so he knows it's one of those guys that he ran with. And it's just like, okay, this is, this is, uh, this is becoming interesting. This is becoming fascinating. And then uh, 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 let's see, Echo, Echo. And does he say this is the man who saved my life? Yeah, he does. Yeah, he says this is the man who saved my life. So that's which, the which, first which, moment where he's signaling to Charlie that he knows who this is and that right. this corpse has a connection to his real. This is in many ways probably the first point in the show where one of the survivors' reality pre island and island sync up. Now does Charlie does Charlie believe him or is Charlie just thinking he's nuts or I think Charlie, Charlie gives him a whole speech doesn't believe him at all. Yeah, cuz why would you believe him? You, you just yeah. met the guy. I mean you, you got Kate coming up to you talking about horse, horses and stuff like that in the episode before. Uh, it's it's crazy, but then he, it, he does put ahead. it together with with the scripture on the stick, right? He he right. says He's a priest. You're a priest because you're writing the scripture on a stick. So Charlie, I guess, right. does put together. Yeah. Okay. No, Char Charlie's not stupid. Uh, then we see Echo walks in and interrupts Yemi's confession. Doesn't make Yemi happy at all. And Echo wants Yemi to make him and his partner a priest. And he goes, well, I can sign the papers, but that's not that's not how you become a priest. You know, you do it by doing good deeds and and living a certain life, I guess. Right. And we see Charlie is lost. I mean, he's, go ahead, go ahead. he's giving his brother like layers and layers of like plausible deniability and yeah. reducing his, like his culpability. It's actually quite impressive. <laughs> right. He's, he's a genius. He, he really is. I mean, he's very persuasive. He's, he's a, uh, that's why they, they had more. Unfortunately, the actor didn't want to stay. He didn't like being on the yeah. island of Hawaii. He wanted to, they wanted him. He was going to have a bigger role, but yep. he didn't uh, want to stay. Charlie's lost, and then Echo says, oh, you're climbing the tree, Charlie. Go higher. Go higher. He goes, I am going higher. Charlie sees the smoke monster, and he, he, he goes, even though he's kind of fed up with Echo, he tells him, run, run. And Echo stares the smoke monster down. Just stares him down. Well, I mean, this is like like the big headline here, right? This is the longest we've seen the smoke monster. Right. And this is the longest we've seen him come out. And Echo doesn't run. He stands there, you know, just like Ivan Drago. And, like, he <laughs> he, he lets himself get scanned. And the smoke man in black, let's call him what he is, yeah. man in black is scanning him, seeing if this guy is worth his redemption right. that he came to the island for. And uh, I think he hasn't made up his mind yet, and that's why he leaves. But he is impressed that he hasn't run. And it's a big deal, too, because I remember when this episode came out, because there were screenshots of what was in mm -hmm. the smoke, what he had scanned. It was his brother, some other, I, I think the I think was the, uh, the statue, right? The statue was in there. I was going to look it up before we recorded. I forgot to, to do it. But I, I remember this being a big deal about what was in the... Uh, what was what? Yeah, when I what you scanned? When I jumped into Lost, right? This had already been happened like a year later, and people were still debating it, right? And so, and I should mention this at this point in time, like 
the fact that people were debating this still like a year later after it showed up, that was actually like a plus to me about the series. Because <laughs> when I was in college, which was, you know, in the mid nineties, we were, and chat boards just started coming online. Right. Like we were debating Twin Peaks, even though it had ended five years earlier. <laughs> So this showed me that like it wasn't just that the fan base of Lost was like about jumping on the hot new thing. It was like people were were debating it and people were like doing as you said the work right. to kind of analyze the image to see what was in there. And it's not like oh just look at this easter egg on the bottom right hand corner of the shot. It's like let's slow this down and look at it frame by frame. Right. right. And, you know, and like I said, it's the birth of all this stuff. So now you have the showrunners very specifically knowing people are doing this. Mm -hmm. Right. So not to, you know, not to jump to my other show again, but if you watch the end of The Leftovers, you they only read a little bit of Kevin's love novel, but if you can stop the whole page and read the whole thing, tons of that kind of stuff in Watchmen right. too. And it's all from being able to, you know, lost coming up with the podcast culture, being able to pause your dvr and and study it well there'd be websites with literally frame by frame stuff so it's like season one again i didn't watch it live during season one but i have to think that season one that people just watched it and then you had all these podcasts coming out you had message boards like you said started coming out um and it people were and websites were being dedicated to each episode what happened in the episode there'd be frame by frame you could I, I remember there was a several up you, you go click it okay oh that's what that is that what that's what that is so in season one they were able just to tell their story and not have to worry about it season two all of a sudden it's like what is what what the hell is going on here what do, what have we what have we done so then like you said Ethan they had to start coming up with stuff each episode to keep us occupied uh, I mean and it's jumping ahead of season but there's one se episode like frame in season three. It's the one where Juliet and Kate are like stuck together, um, but with the handcuffs, and they're right. st stuck in the in the in the branches, and they get you know looked at by the smoke monster comes and takes a picture of them, and right. that frame of the POV of the smoke monster going backwards. I probably looked at that thing at least twenty five or thirty five times. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So, and that's the only I mean, one that, where that, I just feel like, that, there there were literally times I said I need to go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's six in the morning. I gotta be at work in three hours. I got, I got, I gotta go to bed. And then people, oh, lost was on last night. How can you tell? I said, bags under my, you know, no sleep because you couldn't stop thinking about this this TV show that was driving us all crazy. But uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> and here you are, twenty years later, still talking about. It. I know. I can't. I, and, and it's funny. I, when I start first came up with this idea, I go, well, I enjoy doing this. I'm having a blast. I mean, I mean literally, because you get to talk to different people. Everyone has different opinions. Again, it's made perfect, and it's. I'm having fun. The hard again. The hard part for me is stopping. Mm -hmm. It's like okay, I want to watch the next episode. I can't watch the next episode because it's going to get. Because a couple times I I did these out of order. I did I did a couple, and I'm like going, all right, wait a minute. I'm this happened and this. Wait, where are my notes? And so I decided, okay, I got to watch these in order, and record them in order, just because it's it's too confusing for me. To understand what's going on, but and I and I get confused easy, but that's that's just part of life. Uh, Michael goes on the computer. He thinks he's talking with Walt, but again, I, I don't I don't think he's talking to Walt. I, I obviously we know he's not. But then Jack comes in, and Jack with his great bedside. Actually, this was a moment where Jack was actually because I talked about where where uh, and found where where Jen uh, son has lost her ring, and Jack comes up to her and tries to comfort her, and you know you see. He talks about how he lost his ring and you know all this different stuff and how he's looking for it. And she goes, "What'd you do?" He goes, well, "I just had a, a replica made at the jewelry store," which doesn't help her at all. And I'm like going, "Here he was really trying to be helpful, but he has a terrible bedside manner." But I thought here he was actually, yeah. When things calm down, we're going to go out and look for. We'll, we'll go find Walt. This is the one I wanted to talk about before we were getting into the episode. I was talking to Eckhart about you know the having the kid thing, how this is different now watching it. Um, right. Um, this is, this is, Jack sucks here. Jack is terrible here. <laughs> like, 
as a father, like I see, I know I can't watch Adrift because of the screaming of the Walt. I just can't watch that episode. Whoa! Yeah, even that's better than what actually happens in the episode. <laughs> and um, and 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 the way he says, "Hey, man, I know the most important thing of your life was taken from you. We're gonna get around to that at some point. Just hold on. <laughs> it's like, f you, dude. I'm, you know." And Mike's like. Okay, I'm kind of already working on this on the side. So, can you go away with your terrible, terrible coach Jack talk about how you're going to get my son back? Because it kind of should be the top priority of everyone because a child was stolen. You, doctor. You know what I mean? That's, well, yeah, that's a good point. Now, because because, you know? because all in season one, Jack never, if something happened, Jack felt the need to go save that person. Right? Right. Charlie's taken. I mean, Locke even made a good point in season one. You're the doctor. You need to stay behind. We we can't lose the doctor. But, uh, you know, Jack never listened. But in this one, you're right. He did kind of say, yeah, we get around to it. Yeah. That's, a, that's how I, I see it differently. I don't know about you. No, I mean, it's, it's uh, I completely agree. And I mean, it, what really struck me too was that, and I hadn't watched the prior episodes in season two to prepare for this, but I mean, how much time has passed since the end of season one and this episode? A few days? Uh, it's got to be more than a few days. Probably about It's probably about a week, week to 10 days. I mean, it's probably. incredible how collected Michael is. Yeah. I mean, and that's something that, like, I didn't think about or notice, like, the first time around. I mean, they kind of, like... Uh, as a young adult, you kind of write it off because, like, they describe you know, Walt as being the child that he doesn't get to spend much time with and right. stuff like that. But it's like, that makes it probably even worse, right? Right. In the sense that he finally has, and then it's being taken. And, and um, <laughs> he's incredibly like, I mean, the thought that comes to mind, the way that they wrote, I guess, the Michael character at this point in time is that the guy has much more inner strength than he's given credit for. So that when he snaps, it's in which will have, it actually seems much more not forgivable, but makes sense. I mean, it's like there's only so long that he could actually like wait <laughs> without taking matters in his own hands. And like, yeah, well, like what's the thing they're waiting to blow over? Sawyer coming back, dealing with Anna Lucia. They have the guns. I mean, just speaking as a, at, you know, as a parent, as a father, where your mind would be if this happened. Yeah, you know. What well, I, mean? I, I, I can. I'll, I'll try and defend Jack here. Again, he's terrible at bed. He's terrible at small talk bedside manner. But Saeed, who you you want to bring with you, is is someone who's he's distraught right now. He, he he's he's useless. Kate is all over the place. Sawyer is injured. Right, he can't help you. Um, Locke is consumed with the hat, so you can't bring Locke. Analysia, he doesn't really. Analysia just kills somebody. You know, one of your. Are you going to give her a gun again? So I'm going to say, Jack, at this point, who does he have that he can take with him? He doesn't what? know Echo. He doesn't know. Exactly. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't know Echo's flashback. No, yeah. no exactly. Uh, Echo would be the one you want to take. But, uh, you know, he could take Jin. Well, but that's, but, another, that's another thing. It's like no one's mind is on Walt at all. Like True. Except his dad. Right. You know what I mean? And that, that's the point of view I would be at. But do they even know where to look for him? No, but they're not even trying because their mind is on black horses in the jungle. But this one comes down to communication. We know, that, we know Saeed has seen, has, has seen Walt, right? He, you know, whether Whatever it is, he's seen him. He says he's seen him. He told Kate, does anyone go to Jack say, yeah, Saeed said he saw Walt. I, and he, but he also told... Uh, didn't he tell he told Michael he saw Walt, right? I believe when he was tied up when Nano see him tied up, uh say so tied up, he told him he saw Walt. I I, I don't remember. I, I I'm pretty sure that happened, but yeah, I see your point. But um I'm just saying, Jack, remember he wants to build an army. But sure. He doesn't go to Saeed, he goes to Analysia. That's true. Why go why to go to Saeed when you know he's had military training? You go to Analysia, who killed one of your own. Who Saeed was really into. Right. <laughs> Killed the love of his life for the rest of his life. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, 
Um, yeah, I can see your point, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna back Jack up just a little bit because I I think he didn't ha he didn't have much to work with. And that you gonna take Bernard? <laughs> I, I I don't know. He he could take out their teeth. It'd be like uh, Hermie from Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. He'd take out their teeth because he's a dentist. I don't know. I'm, I'm dressing dressing with straws here. Uh, there are a couple of misfits. Yeah, there's 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 a lot of misfits on the show. Uh, Echo and his friends. Are Wait, wait, wait. There's something important which is like to tie into this, which is that Locke is the one that's actually training Michael, right? Yeah, that's true. By yeah. teaching him how to use a gun. But Locke would probably be also the guy where if if Michael would ask him, Can you help me go again? He'd be like, I'd love to, but I gotta press this button. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's not he's not leaving that hatch. Yeah. That's a, that's again a, a Locke would be a Locke, I just always said Locke, I wouldn't follow him into battle, but I'd want him on my side. The general, right? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the general. But I, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't follow him in a battle because he would, he'd be this, I'd be the sacrifice the island needed. So, yeah, right. I, I could, I couldn't trust him on that one. But uh, uh, Echo and his friends are, are loading the plane. Yemi arrives. Yemi tells he goes, yeah, I, I, you can't do this. The military arrives. They start shooting. Yemi gets shot. He gets put in the plane. Uh, the plane takes off. Uh, Wait, I lost my train of thought here. Oh, the plane takes off, but we we come back. Echo, they're going back and forth between off island, on island, off island, on island. Echo finds his brother, and that's where Charlie and he sees the uh, statue, and Echo gives him one statue with the heroin in it. Uh, we find out that Charlie already has a few more statues. Because I was trying to remember, I go. I because I, when they were burning the plane, I go. I remember there's a scene where it's in. I think in one of the hatches where there's a bunch of. Uh, they use it for for something, right? For med Jack uses it for some medical purposes. Am I right? Am I confused? I vaguely remember that. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, it's a great scene. I think I don't know if I you know I know it's family, but I don't know if I could hu hug the corpse of my dead family member. I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, yeah, that's weird. I mean, I, 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 I it, it. I know he probably feels guilty that his brother died. You know, his brother died. He, he'd spent his life trying to. You know, obviously he stepped in to save his brother from a life of, that he had to go through. Um, so I get, I get the emotional. Plus, he, you know, what's the odds of him finding his brother on a plane? He gets in a plane crash. His brother dies on the same island uh, in a plane crash. Um, yeah, it would have been amazing if they had shot the scene. With just Echo and not Charlie there, just right. leave it up for debate if any of that stuff was actually there. Oh yeah, hmm. that's what we needed more more questions, yeah. <laughs> more nuance, <laughs> more, more, more ambiguity. Complexity. Yeah, uh, it was a very more... power. It was a very powerful scene and show of grief. Really, really, really great acting job. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. I mean, again. You can't say enough about the acting. Uh, military believes that Echo is a priest. Are you okay, Father? And Echo's like, well, this could be a good gig. I guess, yeah. I guess, I'm, get, I guess I'm getting away with this. Uh, uh, Echo gives, I said, he gives a statue. Uh, he burns the plane with all the heroin in it. Uh, then Jin, we have the music montage. Jin comes up to Anna Lucia, introduces uh, a son to her, and then gives her a fish. An she unclean smiles. fish. Unclean fish, which Analysia didn't didn't shoot him or anything like that. But it was it was I thought a good scene because there was some friction between Analysia and Jin. But I think Jin, you know, said you know, so we have a different. There's a different Jin in season one, and season oh, two. Yeah. I mean, he's completely di he's completely different. Um, but then uh, Hurley helps Libby with her tent. Hmm? A little smile from Libby there. Something going on there. Uh, Jack comes up and Sawyer, uh, Kate and Sawyer are kind of flirting around with the hair. And Jack comes up and goes, "I ah, here's your pill, Sawyer." And Kate kind of goes, "Where's she? Like, oh, this is awkward for her." But I thought Jack, I thought Jack handled it pretty well. He didn't show the anger he showed earlier. Well, he had a nice drunk. He had a nice drunk one with Anna, Anna Lucia, you know. Now you think that's why he went towards Anna Lucia because he figured that uh, Kate was moving towards uh, Sawyer. I think it was probably someone that also felt like an outsider that he could have a drink with at the time because they had a drink at the bar. 
and he, yeah. he and he needed a connection with someone at the time. <laughs> and they never they never right. finished their drink together, did they? I think maybe Jack, maybe Damon and Carlton were fighting over the remote in terms of what direction to push <laughs> Jack towards. <laughs> Going back and forth, but no, no direction with conviction. I know I've said this a lot. A lot of people cared about the whole Kate Jack Sawyer. I didn't. I mean, I didn't hate it. I just didn't. It wasn't really important to me. And so whoever she picks in the end, I'll be happy with. I don't care. Um, it's amazing how much less I care about it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, but it is important. It, go ahead. Yeah, I was about to say it's important because it, it did. It, it's almost like if they had, like when they review this story or this concept with, you know, whoever, ABC, whoever makes the decision there, they'd be like, okay, no real romance angle. I don't think we can show this, right? Right. Yeah. We're going to lose yeah. a whole target demographic, right? So, mm -hmm. exactly. Off to, off to Sci Fi Channel with you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Claire is is upset with Charlie. You lied to me. He goes, well, yeah, I did. Maybe I did lie a little bit. Uh, she tells him, I can't have you anywhere near my baby. My baby. My and baby, then, but, Charlie. And then she kicks Charlie off. We're like, God, you know, he did. He was. I I get he, he I get he lied, but he's he's done everything for Aaron, hasn't he? He's he's really been he's really stepped up and been like a father to Aaron. And he's not I, breaking it, open the statues to use. No, he's not. I, again, I and I get where you said it was like it was like a uh, it made me stronger knowing it was here and I didn't have to use it. But she wasn't buying it. And I get I can I understand why she was a little upset, but to banish him from the from the uh, from the, the area, you can't sleep here anymore. You're gone. And then. Scene goes off. Charlie is uh, off by himself, and he's got a torch. He lists some thing, and he's got a nice collection of statues. And that's how it ended. So, what did you guys think of this episode? It's fantastic. It was a really, yeah. really good episode of Lost. I liked it. Again, I, I think that's why what Kate did gets overshadowed because of what it followed, and a, a couple of the episodes leading up to what Kate did were really. Like I said, I love what Kate did, but it wasn't as good as this episode. And I also really like the contrast in the fact that, you know, you see a horse that is put there by something, but in this episode, you you know, there's not a there's not there's not a physical thing that's put there by a mystical thing. There's an actual physical thing that cr right. you know crashed for Echo's story. And I found that contrast pretty interesting. Well, one thing I did want to say, do you think Charlie was lying when he said he didn't know where he was lost and didn't know where the plane was? Because he said he saw the plane once he was up in the tree, but the smoke monster came right away. And I, I think he'd be more focused on the smoke monster. So I think Charlie was lying again. Again, we'll never know, but I just, it just seemed odd that, yeah, I climbed with the tree. Yeah, it's over there. I saw it. He hasn't, he hasn't, he hasn't think, told the truth once at that point. So yeah. yeah, I was about to say, he was lying the whole episode. So why stop then, right? Right. Yeah. And plus, he's mad at Echo because Echo kind of, you know, screwed up his deal he had with Claire, right? Blew up his spot for sure. Exactly. Now he's he's off sleeping by himself again. That's that's no fun. But again, I, I think he gets a I think he gets a raw deal with Claire. I think I think she can be upset with it because this is where Jack, doesn't Locke start moving in and kind of assuming the father figure to Aaron, <laughs> right? Yeah. Don't don't we have the baby stealing? Yeah, there's a, there, there, there's a lot of stuff going on where yeah. Charlie really goes down the down the deep end, and but I thought fantastic two fantastic episodes. Uh, anything else you guys want to add to uh, the episodes? No, I'll just or? add Jack that that it was uh, it was an honor to be able to discuss this with you. No, given that, that no, this was this was great. I much, enjoyed it. How much you added to this entire dialogue on Lost? when it first came out and since then. So thank you for allowing us to talk with you about this. I mean, think, I mean, yeah, you got to think about it. You know, it, during the sixth season lost, I felt I needed to listen to someone talk about it. And I found Jay and Jack were talking about it and they were the guys that I glommed on to, to talk about it. And now here I am. I don't know how many years later talking to you about it. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a, it's a mitzvah. It's crazy. You know. Like I said, it's, it's been fun for me. I mean, I, I enjoyed podcasting with Jay, and he's going to do a couple of these episodes down the road. But uh, it's been fun for me talking to diff just talking to different people because everyone has a different – it's like, oh, I never thought about that, never thought about that. 
because over time, you know, you forget a lot of the theories out there until people bring up. Oh, I forgot that was a theory. I forget that it was something. I can't remember what it was last week. Someone I go I forgot all about that. I forgot that that was a theory that someone had out there. It turned out not to be true, but it was like at the time that was a great theory. But that's what this show did. I mean, it just brought, like I said, the community of loss. I don't, I don't know about the community of uh, uh, Twin Peaks, but I've always said the community of loss is the best community out there by far. Well, you'll be happy to know there's a really big overlap between the two, in the sense that if if you're in the Twin Peaks community, you're probably also in the loss community, um, because it tends to be the older people. But I'll, I'll say this. We're still talking about stuff from season one, season two, which happened in 91, 92 today. Like we're still discovering. So you still have made. That's amazing. It's been, it's, it's been that. I've always, I always regret not being part of it because it, it, it was, I love mysteries. I love the who did it type stuff. And uh, that's why it was you, upset me with the killing because the killing was supposed to tell you, and you're guessing all this stuff. They go, Oh, we're going to tell you next season. That's not what you said. Yeah, they really they really turned it around, you know. Yeah. Um, I had all my experiences, my Twin Peak experiences all boiled down to when I was younger into that last episode of Quantum Leap. I, <laughs> I studied that thing like a Zapruder film to try to figure out something about the end of Quantum Leap. And uh, I never did. So uh, that, that was another show I only saw like half of it because I was always working into stuff like that. So I was like... Hey. As a final segue, Ethan, can I ask you something about that? And I'll, I'll, um, I got I'll another hour. Preface, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll preface this by saying this. Okay. I never watched a single episode of Quantum Leap. Yeah. But, oh, really? but in 95, when I was backpacking through China, we bumped into this British guy who was talking to the guy I was backpacking with. And they were talking about the final episode of Quantum Leap. And he had this theory that, like, it was shot before the final season sometime in the past and the evidence that he had is he was talking about something to do with the theme music that they used like the intro music for that episode was from season one as opposed to like the later seasons no for, so. no, no i think that once they shot it knowing not knowing it was going to be the last episode it became the last episode with that awesome title card at the end which just says the doctor spoilers, Dr. Sam Beckett never returned home. And I think because it was the last episode, they had like jazzed up the theme music over time, like giving it extra synth stabs and everything. And I think they just took it back to the original theme music for the last episode. Kind of like, you know, the so leftover bit. Yeah. So you can see Jack that like, just like lost developed your, like perceptive skills. That's what kind of Twin Peaks did for me. It's like, I didn't care. No offense. I didn't care about quantum at all. But when people started deb debating something like this, it's like my ears perked up, right? <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. once, once you, you want to be part of those skills, Once you develop those skills for something that you're passionate about, you start wanting to use them. And, and you start, um, I think in many ways, you start enjoying a good television more. And yeah. then you also pick your, which is probably the downside of it. As as you saw when we talked about Mandalorian a few days ago. <laughs> yeah. I was I was just taking just, just kicking it left and right. <laughs> well, it is hard when you like I said, when you have a show like Deadwood, uh, Twin Peaks, Quantum Leap, you know, shows that are, you know, made you think, you know, breaking bad. It shows uh, like well, Deadwood didn't really make you think, but it, it made you it was so well done that you just you were you, you hang in on every word. You know, I have shows that I watch that. Yeah, I have shows. I like. I watch. I watch the new Magnum PI. I, I, it is what it is. You know, it's 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 uh, it's my popcorn show. It's a show I can just sit there and put on and just kind of relax. And then I have my shows. I have to like Silicon Valley just ended. And I'm like going for me. It is and it's like kind of binge watched it the final season. I'm like, oh god, this show is just so good. It was just so clever and so good. And you're just like going. God, I don't want to leave. And then you go, okay, I moved to that. And you, you were, you sent me a message. Have you been watching Secessions? And I watched the first season as it aired. And this season, I just fell behind, mainly because it's rewatch. And I said, I got to watch it. I got to watch it because I still have Man in the High Castle. I've only watched one episode of that one so far. Uh, Peaky Blinders. I'm in the, the final season. But I have two more episodes of that one. It's just like, I just don't have time. And then I have my grandkids every day. So it's like, there's no time to, uh, 
As soon as this is over, I'm going to go swimming in the expanse for a while. I mean, that show's amazing. <laughs> now, I heard that's a great show, too. It's, it's like a great the, show. Three seasons in? So, yeah. Ethan, maybe you can um, correct me on this, but I heard that the original premise of Expanded was basically the result of, of like a some somebody was running a tabletop RPG session. That I, it was actually. I, I know it's books, but I wouldn't know about that. Okay, I wouldn't know because that was like a friend of mine who works, who works in the video game and RPG industry was saying that like his first reaction when Expanse first came out was like, this is really like the power of shared storytelling that like they turned their campaign into this actual story. <laughs> I mean, that, it would it would not it would not surprise me at all. the The world they have woven is so big, and and so interesting. <laughs> it I, it wouldn't surprise me in the least. I gotta be honest. I, when I first heard Expanse, I go, I thought it was a new show coming, and it says, "Oh no, no, it's season three. I go, oh, so I've already missed f- first two seasons. Well, I guess I got to catch up because I thought it was going to be a new show coming out in December. I said, "Oh yeah, I'll watch that. Sounds like pretty interesting." And I go, they said, "No, no, no, it's the third season." I go, "Oh crap, I'm so no, there's no, there's only there's ten per season, yeah, or ten or twelve, and it was on Sci-Fi, and now Amazon picked it up. After I still haven't campaign. watched, I still haven't watched season two of The Dark yet. I heard oh. that. I heard that was good. I haven't watched it yet. I heard it yet. <laughs> oh, Jack, you're missing something really. I, I dark. know, and I, I, I know, and I, I love the first season was so good, and I'm like going, I gotta watch it. But doing this rewatch, okay? Is there dubbing so, in that? There's dubbing in that, right? Yeah, there's dubbing in it. And to give you a little bit of background, Ethan, um, so I'm half German, and I went to German school, so I'm <laughs> watching it in the original German. And the thing about it is, it's, I mean, everything German is obviously dark. But the German, the German touchstone. So in our culture, our touchstone is like Western and sci-fi, right? In Germany, the touchstone is more like Grimm's fairy tale, but you know, dark stories about like the witch eating the kids and the, the wolf real, eating the grandmother. The real Grimm's fairy tales. Yeah. Not yeah. The, not yeah. The yeah. Disney version. So yeah. dark falls into that tradition in terms of like just very unsettling but let me tell you something jack season you've seen season one of dark oh yeah okay before you watch season two watch season one again because dark season two is the like puzzle sci-fi fantasy show that has made me work the hardest ever like they really make you work and if you liked ethan if you liked season five of of lost yeah this Season two of Dark is like season five on steroids. I'm all about it then, because season one, is, <laughs> season, one, season one is excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've heard definitely heard. Season good two, Jack, you really have to have pen and paper. All right, that'll be my that'll be my next. I'll, I'll I was gonna do Secessions next, but I'll go do Dark first. I'll get, I gotta finish the Expanse, but then I'm gonna do Dark, and I started watching Rectify, which seems to be pretty good. Yeah, I, I guess people right. suggesting so, so many shows. I go, I go so many. I'm, I'm getting older. I don't have my rewatch. Here, the here's my re- rewatch. Yeah. The <laughs> here's my recommendation: get anything light out of the way before watching dark. <laughs> <laughs> because, because what you want to do is okay, Jack. You probably have to arrange your schedule around your grandkids, right? Yeah. So you want to wait until your grandkids are out of the picture. <laughs> and that's ever the case. So watch all the light stuff then, including Men the High Castle. That's light enough. My Get granddaughter would actually shot. has actually watched a few episodes of Lost with me. She's sixteen months old. She'll sit there. Yeah. She'll sit there for a while watching it with me. Then watch watch season one dark again, and then immediately season two because what I realized watching season two dark was that they basically chopped one season in half. Oh really? Yeah, because it just it continues immediately, and it, it, you realize that the last few episodes of of season one, Dark, really should have been the first few episodes of the second season, or vice versa. Right? It's funny with Dark. It's, I it's in- it was, I would, I'd either watch the dubbing version or I'd close caption because I sometimes I was too tired to read. It'd be like three yeah. o'clock in the morning. I'd because I think the final couple episodes, I was up to like six in the morning. I watched like the last three episodes. And I said I can't read this, but the, the dubbing is hard to watch because it's it's not done well. It, the the sad thing about it is, from you know thinking about it from most viewers' standpoint on Netflix outside of Germany, is, is that the actual like the acting 
and and the diction that they use in German is phenomenal. Like it's really like on the level of like what you would I guess equate for like the best BBC type dramas. Well, it's almost like Narcos. I mean, Narcos is. I mean, it it would get to the point where I was reading, where I'm watching Dark and it's they're dubbing the German. I'm like, I'm almost. I'm I'm reading the words. Yeah. But I'm not. I'm not acting. How do I explain this? I'm not. I'm not consciously knowing I'm reading the words. I'm just, I'm watching their voice. Yeah. It's coming in. Cause like Narcos did the same thing. I'd be, it's like 75% Spanish and you're like going, and I, but I'd be into the, you'd forget. Yeah. Cause I tried to get my wife to watch it. You forget about the closed cap. You forget about it because it's, it's the story so good that you get rolled in, you get involved in the story. <laughs> and you're like going, she goes, nah, I'm gonna go watch Grey's Anatomy. So, anyway. so she, she, she does, she does love Deadwood though. I'll give her that. So you're saying first, Finish my expanse, learn German, <laughs> watch. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll be I'll be blunt. It might be the only German show ever worth watching. <laughs> it's a romance well, now, language. Well, now that I got my twenty three me update, I'm more German now than I was before. So, I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> Matt. I'm still I'm still really British. I'm still really uh, English. So. Irish and English, you know. Well, well technically, I, didn't you didn't you say, Jack, that you could trace it back to like the Swiss region? Yeah, I have uh, I found a a website where someone had dedicated my last name, and I found it all to 1516 in Swi uh, Switzerland. And there's yeah. a town there's a t there's a town in in Switzerland called Glattfelten, G L A T T E F, yeah. and we went to a we went to Switzerland just to to go there, and I kept telling the the travel age, I go, she goes, I go, it doesn't show that you can take a train to this. She goes, take a train everywhere. I go, all right, I'm looking at Gladfelton. Here's Gladfelton. It, it's, there's no train going there. And it, they all convinced me not to rent a car. We spent like three or four hours. We got to Gladfelton station, but there was another 30, 40 miles to go before we got, I don't know. It was, I, don't, I don't know how far it was, but I was so ticked off at that point. I was like, just get me home. I, I love Switzerland. I, so, I can live, I can live there, but so, there's a tidbit I'll give you about Switzerland, which I only learned recently, even though, you know, I've known Swiss people all my life, was that, and this will tie into your personality, Jack, is that Swiss were actually, before they were known for their watches or for their offshore Mike. banking and concealing money for, you know, Mr. Echoes, um, the Swiss <laughs> were actually known for being the toughest mercenaries in the probably oh, really? in the 15th and 16th century. Yeah. Like, and they were known as the guys that would just, they would have these really long pikes and they would just charge the enemy force and they just keep running and running. And just like, they were the mercenaries that like the Austrians and the French and the Italians would hire basically to fight, you know, the other side in the, in the 16th century and they I were did probably know that. yeah they were probably the toughest foot soldiers and it, what it really was amazing about it was it was like their industry like they would put together these mercenary companies that would fight in outside of switzerland and parts of france in italy <laughs> and they were just known as like guys who wouldn't take shit from anyone <laughs> sound familiar <laughs> jack yeah 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 it's my people <laughs> exactly. I'll leave this, it at that. This, and then eugenics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about that. That's great. Like, so, well, I, I, unfortunately, my dad before he passed away, I, I didn't know. He didn't elaborate a lot. And we were back in Pennsylvania. We we're up in Pennsylvania, and my my great aunt and my uncle were all talking. That's when we first heard about Gladfelton. And it was my oldest daughter went and traced it back to Switzerland. All this, my dad, and, and then we found out there was a there's a town in Pennsylvania called called Gladfelter. It's it was like mm -hmm. 15 minutes from my grandmother's house in East, in East Pennsylvania, Berlin. In Pennsylvania, East, yeah, East Berlin. My grandma lived in East Berlin, Pennsylvania. That's where my dad grew up. East Berlin, Pennsylvania, a little hick town, little one road type thing. And I, he goes, well, "You guys care about that? You want to see it?" I go, "Well, yeah." And there's a Gladfelder paper mill. There's a Gladfelder's like in Pennsylvania's like Smith everywhere else. It's very, the name is very common, but uh, my dad was not one to, sh he started sharing stuff later on in life, but stories that he, he would tell stories about him growing up when he was a hellraiser, but it was like, 
but he didn't tell stories about the family. It's like, well, no, I find that interesting. I find that fascinating. Well, if I would have known, I would have told you sooner. I just Googled I'm 27 miles away. From uh, uh, Gladfelter? Mm-hmm. Right by York and uh, mm-hmm. what, part of Pens- what part of Pennsylvania? In? I'm in Westminster, Maryland. Okay. Oh, Maryland. Yeah, oh, yeah really? that's right. Out of the, yeah. Mm-hmm. But you're in Maryland, right? Yeah, in Bethesda. Are yeah. you? Yeah, other side of the state. Yeah, you're in you're in Moco. Yeah, that's where I grew up. So, oh man, uh, Jay and Jack meet up time. Yeah, uh, there we go. My but mom lives in Rockville. Jay. Only Jack. <laughs> yeah. Hey, by the way, I've been to, I've, I've been to Pennsylvania in a few years. It's been a oh, while. The, the episode for season two hasn't happened yet with the McCutcheon, right? That comes in season three, right? Or I think it's season three, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's oh, well, it's it, it, it's a constant, right? It's no, no. It, it's near there. It's definitely when you get more into the what's his face, Desmond Penny, Desmond Penny, Widmore I mean, situation. Were, I mean, so at that point in time in the Jane Jack podcast, I mean, I already knew that Jack was just a comedic genius and had these really <laughs> high high level perception skills. But when you made the comment to Jay about how he wasn't worthy of drinking the McCutcheon, <laughs> I mean, that was just like, that's where you achieved immortality. You know? <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure that that's reflected in the official record. <laughs> this whole second part's getting was, not on the show, right? <laughs> oh, it's on there. Jack, Jack that was... <laughs> Jack, that was your Psalm 23. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess on that note, I, I think we have set a record for the longest uh, lost rewatch. We just be yep. it, this is like the third week in a row. It's gone over two hours. And we're at two hours and sixteen minutes. Yep. But well, I, I, I really I had do, fun. I, Thank you. No, I appreciate you guys showing yep. up, taking time out of your schedule, and this is a fun talk. And we'll have to do it again sometime. And we All still right, have sounds four good. More, Take still, care. Still have four more seasons ago, so. We'll be here. <laughs> All right. And remember, people watching at home, if you if you've stayed this long, this will be the last one until after the first of the year. So you got plenty of time to catch up. All right, guys. We're out. Bye. <laughs>